Welcome. My name is Jonathan Ridnell. I will be your, I'll call it MC for the day. You might remember me from such things as ABC Radio a few years ago. And uh, I can very proudly say I was an employee of the North Central Catchment Management Authority. And um, unlike the other staff, I've only spent four actual days at the NCCMA office. The rest of the time I was uh, in Zoom meetings, working from home, and wondering who these people who say, hello, Jonathan, are. And I say, you don't look anything like your Zoom picture. Maybe I was too busy checking out the books on your bookshelf behind you. Um, it's a delight to be here. Soil is one of the things that I love. It is the foundation on which our ecosystem is built on which our civilization is built and when there's no healthy soil there's no people so while we're here i need to talk about things like the partners that we have it's it's part of a continued effort to establish and sustain a culture of caring for land in our region we need to recognize the ongoing effort to sustain productive soils and ecological integrity so over years, so many farming communities, agencies and initiatives have focused on programs concerned with sustaining the health of our soils, recognising that our lives and the lives of our descendants depend on achieving positive outcomes. Land managers battle wind and water erosion, salinity, soil acidity, loss of soil structure and many, many more issues in a claiming child climate and while we have a partial victories on some of these areas I was told last night proudly that we had solved salinity and then they said no only joking for example so uh, just because it's not in the news doesn't mean it's a real challenge for our land managers we recognize the extreme challenges in attaining sustainability and this is where I'd really like to know the room who in this room identifies as a primary producer who here identifies as an extension worker? And who are, some, and this is okay, it's a Venn diagram, we're allowed to have overlap, all right? Who identifies then as a hmm, researcher? Okay, yeah, okay, interesting. And I, I'm liking the overlap, that's very good, because one of the things I will be talking about later is citizen science, because it's not on the agenda for anyone else. And uh, who is here just because they're interested because soil is the most amazing medium in the world? That's the one where everyone's meant to put their hands up. <laughs> okay, so now that I know that we've actually got a captive audience that's not necessarily quite as excited about soil as myself and Phil, then we'll see how we go. Right, today we're going on a three-tiered journey. We're going to start the morning with the big picture, a chance to hear from our National Soils Advocate, the Honourable Penny Wensley AC. We'll drill down to a state and local level with Dr Peter Dalhouse, a Senior Research Fellow at CERTI. We'll have a chance then to reflect on some of those big picture issues and how we're applying local knowledge to fixing these major issues. And then uh, after that, we'll get a chance to, well, figuratively get our hands dirty and we'll hear from people on the ground and some of the projects that are being carried out in sustainable, <laughs> regenerative agriculture and sustainable agriculture too. Um, we're seeking to unite those of us already engaged in restoring and nur nurturing sustainable soils. That's some of you by a show of hands. While, while seeking to raise awareness about the, about the uh, need to achieve sustainable agriculture goals to those people who are not here the people who vote for politicians, the people who vote with their dollars to make sure they're aware that uh, the soil that you are working with on a daily va basis is invaluable to them. Now, beautiful artwork there. I'm going to replace that now with a barcode or a QR code. And funny enough, if you went to a conference four years ago and put up a QR code, people would be saying, what is that? I think that you now know what that does. We're using a piece of software called Slido today. Those of you who are conference junkies probably know all about it. If you are not, then this is actually a gateway to a live stream of today's proceedings. It's a gateway to a chance to ask questions rather than put your hand up. So, for example, we might have a guest speaker and you think immediately, that's a question I want to ask. And if you're like me, in 10 minutes when the talk is over, you've forgotten what that question was, this is a chance to actually 
um, register that question straight away. What I want you to do with that is get the URL and send it to your network. We are going to a lot of effort to have beautiful cameras up there that are putting our guest speakers online. Wouldn't it be great if you could encourage your friends and colleagues and fellow agriculturists to share this and say, look, National Soilers Advocate is on in 10 minutes, tune in. Great messaging that's local to our part of the world. We also want you to trend us. So we've decided to go for an absolutely brand new hashtag that no one has ever used before in the world, hashtag CMA Soils. So if you are a Twitterer, if you are a Instagrammer, if you are on um, Facebook, absolutely. If you're on TikTok, shame on you, but you could even do it there as well. Did you find the toilets in your, when you arrived? If you go back out into reception and turn right, down the corridor, women's is pretty well straight ahead. Boys, you have to turn right and look for the, for the figure. Morning tea will be served in the Bendigo Bank Room, which is also our trades fair. So if you've got some questions about how some organisations can help you achieve some of your goals, that's a good place to be. And you've, most of you found the coffee urn not that long ago as well, so well done on that. If there is a crisis, look for the people in black. They will tell us where to go to stay safe. Oh, and one last thing, don't do a Jonathan and have your ringtone ruin the moment. Can you just turn your phone to silent or vibration, please? Done. Okay, the first thing I'd like to do is to establish that we are um, meeting on a land that has traditional owners, and those traditional owners are very generous with sharing that land with us. And can you please welcome to the podium Peter Hudson to give us a proper welcome to country. Thanks, Peter. Woman Jenka to Jajarang Jandak, ancestral homelands of the Jara people. I wish to acknowledge elders past, present and those present today. And I'd also like to acknowledge my apical ancestors, Emma Kerr and Tom Denoli. And I'm just going to read you a bit out of um, Jajarang's country plan and it's titled Our Country. Jajarang territory extends from Mount Franklin and the towns of Quez Queswick and Dalesford in the southeast to Castlemaine, Maldon and Bendigo in the east, Bort in the north, Donald in the northwest, to Navarre Hill and Mount Avoca, marking the southwest boundary. Our territory encompasses the Bendigo and Clunes Goldfield and the Loddon and Avoca River watersheds. Hundreds of years ago, our country was mostly covered in open forests, woodlands, providing us with plants and animals, that we use for food, medicine, shelter and customary practices. Today, though, our country is vastly changed. It still holds many important values. Our box iron bark forests do not occur anywhere else. Important tucker and medicine species can still be found across our country. Eels, mussels, crays and fish like Murray, Cod and Yellowbelly are in our rivers. Emu, goanna, possum, kangaroo and wallaby have been sustainably used on this country for thousands of years and continue to be important to us. We use local plants like lamandra, saltbush, nardoo, wattle, red gum and chocolate lilies, just to name a few. Our, U our country is now also valued by other people and cultures. European and Asian cultural heritage is strong, particularly particularly through the gold mining history of our region, which continues to influence the recreational pursuits of prospecting and fossicking that are practised today. Local industries, including beekeeping, forestry, agriculture and tourism, depend on the natural resources that our country provides. Thank you and enjoy your conference. Thank you so much, Peter. And before you go, a quick gift to say thank you for coming to our conference to welcome us. Thank you. Appreciate it. No worries. You, you probably know those plants better than we do. <laughs> Let's meet the boss. Brad Drust is the CEO of the North Central Catchment Management Authority, and he leads the organisation to create natural resource management partnerships and programs that deliver lasting change. Brad's focus is on effective project delivery 
and community engagement that are central to the authority delivering its role for government. Brad also knows this work cannot be done as a standalone and is proud of the way the Catchment Management Authority partners with local communities, traditional owners, industry, science and government to enhance our region's natural resources. The other thing that Brad doesn't have in his LinkedIn uh, profile that I quite shamelessly stole for that is that if you believe it, it's his 20th year this year as an employee of the North Central CMA. So he's been around the traps a little bit. Brad, thank you very much for joining us today. All right, thank you, Jonathan. And yes, you are correct, 20 years uh, at the CMA. Why would you want to be anywhere else other than working in this part of the world uh, in natural resource management? It's just wonderful work to be doing. Um, a big welcome to you all to our Sustainable Soils Forum uh, today. Um, this forum, of course, being part of our Regenerative Ag project, it's, um, it's really fantastic to see so many people so passionate about soils in the, um, in the room with us physically today and uh, I hope online virtually with us as well. So thanks so much for being here. Can I uh, just also say thank you to Peter for that um, welcome to country this morning and um, in commencing can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, that we're meeting on this morning, the Jara people and uh, the six other traditional owner groups um, who are the uh, custodians of the land that we work across in the north central region. Um, could I recognise their rich and enduring connection to that land and the ongoing and essential role that they play in caring for it um, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend those uh, respects to any Aboriginal people who might be with us today. Uh, would you believe this is the fifth time um, that we've put together this style of forum um, since we first established the successful community-based farming for sustainable soils project back in 2009 now? Um, and while the focus for today is uh, what's next, What's next in ag? Um, I did want to tell a brief story about how we got here before we get to looking forward. So at that time, back in 2009, um, we really saw a need as a CMA um, in North Central Victorian farming communities um, to bring those communities together to explore improved uh, land management practices at a local scale. And if you think back to what was happening in 2009, we're at the tail end of the millennium drought, uh, waiting for 2010 and 11 to occur and bring us lots of rain and water, but um, it was a pretty challenging time, so bringing the communities together at that point in time was really important for us. Um, and this type of project was a first for the CMA in the sustain sustainable ag space and it provided a platform to bring those like-minded farmers together. Some of you in the room might have been part of all of that, um, and bring uh, practical information and resources um, that were required to restore and regenerate land. Um, that innovative farming for sustainable soils uh, model that was funded by the Australian Government's Caring for Our Country um, program at the time was about securing the productive capacity and ecological function um, of our soils. Uh, under that banner, we then uh, worked for about nine years with our farming communities and um, then morphed that Farming for Sustainable Soils program into what's now our Regenerative Ag project. Over those past sort of 14, 15 years, since uh, we started in 2009, um, the projects that we've been working on have collectively worked with 19 different farming communities across the North Central region. Uh, and connected more than 570 landholders, um, the people out there working day to day um, on looking after our soils um, in those priority areas. Over the last four years, as part of our Regen Ag project, um, we've coordinated 82 different training activities um, and workshop events for farmers with a focus on soil health regenerative and regenerative ag principles. Um, held 24 different on-farm trial demonstrations with 41 farmers having changed their grazing practices to increase ground cover that equates to a potential area of around 28,000 hectares. Uh, that's over just four years. Um, and 46 farmers are now sowing more than one species of crop or pasture in the same paddock to ensure that something will grow 
um, given the vagaries of uh, climate these days, so something to suit wet times and something to suit dry times, over a potential area of about an additional 31,000 hectares. Um, these activities are increasing the awareness and adoption in land management practices that improve and protect the condition of soil biodiversity and vegetation. And we're all here today, of course, to celebrate the achievements of that project and appreciate some of the lessons learnt over its lifetime. Uh, I should say it's lifetime to date because there's more to come. Um, this afternoon, you'll hear directly of many of the achievements of those efforts um, through the presentations from the participating farming communities. Um, today we'll also have the opportunity to consider the global health imperatives um, and also local actions to secure our soils for the future and to this end, as Jonathan said, we're, we're really, really pleased and really, really lucky to have the Honourable Penelope Wensley, the National Soils Advocate, with us today. Um, so thanks so much, uh, Penny, for accepting our invitation to join us. Um, we're equally pleased to have uh, Associate Professor Peter Dalhouse, Senior Research Fellow with the Centre for E-Research and Digital Innovation, um, to delve deeper into our local soils. Thanks for joining us, uh, Peter. Uh, and uh, even more likely, uh, Jessica Conlon, the 2022 Nuffield Scholar, to share her lessons from overseas uh, and how they can strengthen our farming system. So thanks, Jessica. Uh, of course, today is not just about listening. Um, so we've pur purposely built in some thinking and some discussion time into our agenda today um, so that you'll have the opportunity to share the local issues, the local opportunities, the sort of things that you want to see um, happen in our region regarding soil health and sustainable farming systems. So I would invite you to make the most of those opportunities throughout the day as they arise. As I said, uh, we're reflecting on what's been learned to date, but um, there's more to come. Um, so our team's currently planning for the next stage of our work with sustainable soil management, and we really would appreciate hearing your thoughts about priorities for the future to help shape that work. Uh, so we promise you uh, an interesting and informative day, um, and at this point, invite you to listen to our excellent speakers and as I said, participate when the opportunity arises for you to get a little bit involved. That's all from me for now. Uh, I really do hope that you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much, Brad, for setting the scene for us. You've only been mentioned twice, Penny, before uh, you get your official introduction, so I think everyone is really looking forward to meeting you. The Honourable Penny Wensley AC was appointed National Soils Advocate in February 2020. Former Governor of Queensland, distinguished Australian di diplomat, uh, Penny's interest in soils, soil health and sustainability dates from the early 1990s, when amongst many other ambassadorships, Penny was the ambassador for the environment. This experience established a deep conviction of the importance of managing our natural resources in a sustainable way. I think people in this room call it SNRM, right? Sustainable Natural Resource Management. The, the acronyms are coming back, I promise. Ms Wensley is a Fellow of the Australian Institute of International Affairs and an Honorary Fellow of the Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand. Penny is a director of the Lowy Institute and chairman of the Great Barrier Reef Advisory Committee. Penny is also patron of Soil Science Australia, the Soil Cooperative Research Centre and the Australian Organics Recycling Association. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Penny. We look forward to hearing your thoughts. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Jonathan, for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you to the North Central Catchment Management Authority for inviting me to be part of this important forum focused on sustainable soils. Uh, as Brad uh, reminded us, uh, this is the fifth conference 
The authority has delivered on soils and sustainable agriculture over the past 13 years, and that's really a terrific track record. In the spirit of national reconciliation, I joined Jonathan and Brad acknowledging the first peoples to know and seek sustenance from these lands, the Jajawarang people and the six other TO groups that uh, Brad mentioned. I don't know all of their names, uh, but I'm now going to go and research them <laughs> further. And uh, I think Peter's gone, uh, Peter Hudson, but uh, I thank her for uh, her welcome to country and for sharing some of the information about the history of this lands and uh, these lands and the involvement of the traditional owners with them. I do recognise that ongoing sense uh, of connection, that cultural and spiritual connection that they have with the lands and waters of this region. And I acknowledge also that traditional owners have passed on through successive generations knowledge and understanding to help us safeguard and conserve the resources and the natural assets that sustain us all. Although caring for country has uh, assumed a, a special significance for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, we are all stewards of these assets. Their protection and conservation is a shared responsibility, one that has become much more evident and more urgent as the pressures on our environment increase, linked most obviously to the impacts of climate change and our warming planet, but also here in Australia to a range of other factors uh, about which I expect Bill uh, may be talking about in his remarks. Australia has uh, very significant soil challenges. Uh, we're the oldest, flattest, driest continent on Earth, inhabited continent, uh, don't forget Antarctica, on Earth. And uh, our soils are old and weathered and fragile. So we started out with a lot of pressures and they've increased. I was asked to speak about conserving and improving the health of Australia's soils. Now, that's obviously a subject that's very dear to my heart as Australia's national soils advocate, uh, a position that I've held not since February, since August 2020, uh, succeeding the late uh, Michael Jeffrey, a figure well known to some in this audience, uh, and not least because he attended the 2018 uh, Soils Conference hosted by this region. Australia is unique in having such a, a position. It, it was a world first uh, and it is still uh, the only country to have a national soils advocate. It began as uh, a position called the Advocate for Soil Health uh, and that was established in 2012 by the then Labor government, led by Julia Gillard, following a report that was produced by a parliamentary working group on water, soil and food that advised very simply that more attention needed to be given to raising awareness of the importance of soil and the important role that soil can play in addressing national and global challenges. Sounds simple, but a, a, a very important presentation of the issue. More attention needs to be given to raising awareness of the importance of soil, soil and the role soil can play in addressing national and global challenges. Seven years later, in July 2019, the then government, led by Prime Minister Morrison, effectively elevated the position, deciding that it should be made permanent 
it had waxed and waned and there'd been periods without it, um, uh, but that it should be a permanent position and it should be renamed as the National Soils Advocate, consistent with that national mission of addressing national and global challenges. And at the same time, the government determined that there should be a national soils strategy. That was achieved in 2021, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The core responsibility of the advocate is to, quote, raise awareness of the vital role soils play and to provide leadership and advocacy on the importance of conserving and improving the health of Australia's soils. So now I know where you got your title from. <laughs> Looked up the website. The early terms of reference for the position focused heavily on agriculture, reflecting the strong and obvious link between soil and agriculture and soil health as the foundation of productivity. That obviously continues as a key area of attention and of action, but the 2021 National Soil Strategy looked well beyond agriculture, emphasising the importance of sustainable soil management for many different sectors. And accordingly, the scope of the advocates' work was broadened to raise awareness of the benefits that soil and soil health, healthy soil, provides across multiple areas. To quote the strategy, and again, this is in good, plain, direct language, not filled with bureaucraties that you find in a lot of government documents. Not all Australians, including the public, government agencies, industry and the private sector, have a good understanding or appreciation of soil. Many see it as just dirt. Many are unaware of or overlook soil's critical linkages and the benefits it provides to the environment, to infrastructure, to human health. The Australian government recognises the value of soil and acknowledges the need to embed an appreciation of this value across relevant portfolios and services. It established a National Soils Advocate for this reason. The role of the National Soils Advocate is to be an independent voice for the importance of good soil management and health and to advocate to ministers, industry and senior executives across governments and the private sector. Now, that presents a considerable challenge, which I'm sure you can appreciate, but one of the things that assists me in my advocacy work with policy makers and decision makers in both the public and the private sector is to get out in the field, literally, as I did yesterday at Tumby Wood in Runnymede with Jess and Joe, and figuratively, as here in this forum, to connect with individuals and organisations who are actually walking the talk of soil health and management. And in the case of the NCCMA, have been doing it for a considerable time. Preparing for today and for my visit to this particular part of Victoria, I was genuinely impressed by how much effort this region has given to soil health. And I was more than a little curious to understand why. What was the impetus for the Farming for Sustainable Soils project that ran from 2009 to 2018? What prompted the conclusion that was set out in the 2013 North Central Region Catchment Strategy that this region needed to develop a soil action plan that produced the Soil Health Guide in 2016, the guiding principles for soil health in 2018, and the Soil Health Action Plan in 2019. Was it, was it the drive and leadership of passionate individuals? Was it the input 
the interest and encouragement of soil experts? Did the fact that the land care movement officially started only 118 kilometres west of, uh, of here in Windjala play a role? Uh, and there is a very, very strong land care network across this region. I'm very aware of that. I've been associated with land care from its inception. Um, was it because this region has particular soil challenges? Maybe we'll hear a bit more about that. Uh, or has suffered climatic pressures and shocks at different times? Or a combination of different factors? My uh, farm visit yesterday and the discussions that we had last night over dinner with uh, uh, the Catchment Management Authority staff and local farmers and landholders um, and Brad's comments this morning uh, have helped, I think, find some of the answers. But uh, it, it is a very impressive track record and I think it's instrumental, it's important for that we gain an understanding of what has driven this. And I'm really looking forward to learning more today so that I can draw on your experience to encourage others to take a similar path. Because at the national level, and indeed globally, we do need to lift our game. I don't want to trespass on Peter's talk about the status of soils, but some facts merit emphasis, emphasis. Despite many years of research, despite 30 years of land care, despite a succession of soil conservation programs and a high level of will by many farmers and graziers to do better through the adoption of better practices, Soil health metrics are declining almost universally. For example, it's been estimated that approximately half of the original soil carbon has been lost in Australian agricultural soils through clearing native vegetation. In Victoria alone, the direct cost of salinity is estimated to be $50 million a year with some 140,000 hectares of irrigated lands and 120,000 hectares of dry land significantly affected. The 2021 State of the Environment report, and one could question some aspects of its methodology and its data collection, but uh, this report produced every five years does contains some very important messages uh, about the state of Australia's environment. And this told a sombre story about soil, saying that Australia's soil is not in good condition. The overall assessment that the report gave is that Australia's health is, uh, soil health is poor and deteriorating. On intensive agricultural land, the assessment was even worse, with a rating of very poor. It's difficult to put a cost on this, but the Murray-Darling Basin Authority estimated that soil erosion alone costs Australia about 500 million every year in lost agricultural production and the associated effects on water quality. I don't know how many of you uh, watched or read some of uh, Tanya Plibersek, the new Minister for Environment's um, uh, address to the National Press Club when she was releasing this report in July last year. But she said, on soil particularly, and as you'll imagine, I watch like a hawk for anything that any parliamentarian or minister uh, is, or departmental secretary is saying on soil. She said, as a result of erosion, deforestation, intensive agriculture and climate change, Australia's soil is now generally in poor condition and getting worse. We're losing topsoil, letting it blow away without vegetation to protect it. Our soils are less productive, less fertile, less efficient at holding water. 
And that means that our agricultural output is lower than it could be. Our land is more susceptible to drought, although I've been hearing about floods here, uh, and our soil's ability to regenerate and support life is diminished. So the message is clear. We need to commit more attention to conserving and improving the health of Australia's soils. It's a message that this community, this audience knows and understands well, and I hate preaching to the converted. But not everybody gets it. In June 21, my office, uh, the office of the National Soils Advocate, which is led by Sue Besto, who's here, and I hope you all uh, take the opportunity to talk to her. She's the real soil expert, an agronomist, <laughs> um, with lots of uh, qualifications in soil science, climate science, ag science. But uh, with Sue's drive, uh, we commissioned uh, DBM consultants to undertake a two-year soil perception study to gauge stakeholder awareness of soil and soil health and also of the advocate's role because we need to make sure that we're actually delivering on what we're meant to do. Uh, and in November last year, the first of two rounds of the quantitative surveys were concluded and I've reported to ministers on this. I report every quarter in the form of a personal letter in which I can be very candid and, and hard-hitting. Uh, the results from 900 respondents across three main stakeholder categories, regional community members, farmers and land managers and industry representatives, showed a high level of support uh, for the advocates' main mission to advocate and support policies that protect, restore and maintain the health of Australia's landscape. 67% for regional communities, 73% for land managers, 85% from industry stakeholders. So that was an interesting range, uh, all at the high end. There were, however, respondents who indicated that they didn't understand the purpose of the role. And they quite clearly were those who had very little concern for soil health, for conservation, uh, and for issues of sustainability. The survey found that familiarity with sustainable soil practices was relatively low within general regional communities, with over a quarter having no familiarity whatsoever, Brad, with sustainable land management practices, a quarter of the general regional communities in Australia. Unsurprisingly, land managers were much more engaged with soil health and took a positive view of their ability to manage soil health. Surprisingly, well, at least to me, the survey found that more than half of land managers viewed the soil in their land areas as being in good condition. And 45% believe the condition of their soil is improving. Now, maybe, remembering when the surveys were done, that's got something to do with La Nina and three good years. Uh, and although the uh, final round of the soil perception survey has yet to be completed. It'll be done in April this year. Uh, it, and it'll be interesting to see if there's any variation in those figures. But I, I do actually draw already a number of conclusions from these results that fundamentally there is an ongoing need for awareness raising, more awareness raising about soil health issues in the general population. I mean, we already knew that, that that was needed. The lack of attention to soil, soil the forgotten resource, the lack of awareness of the value of soil, of the multiple services that soils deliver has been a problem. It has been the lament of soil scientists for centuries that soil is neglected. But also, 
we are going to have to focus on this issue in the wider public, uh, that there is insufficient appreciation of the importance of soil and the critical importance of healthy soil for healthy communities, healthy planet. And that focus on regional communities, I think, is something, maybe we can draw some lessons from what you're doing here. There's a need for more data, there's a need for better monitoring, there's a need for more information, there's a need for more facts and figures to inform land managers about the state and the condition of Australia's soils, uh, about the soils in their own region, on their farms, on the tools and the practices available to restore degraded soils, to improve soil health, to build soil resilience and achieve soil sustainability. And we need more research to address information gaps. There's also a need to inform and persuade those decision makers and policy makers at all levels of government, local, state and territory, and the Commonwealth Government, of the need not just to talk about the importance of soil, but to commit effort and resources and funding to soil. This is not easy in the current very difficult budgetary circumstances with many competing policy priorities and you only have to watch the news every single night or listen to the radio to understand that. We are all awaiting the May budget with keen interest to see where soil sits and what might be funded. There have been some encouraging signs and comments over recent months most notably from the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forests, and I think not coincidentally, the Minister for Emergency Management, uh, Murray Watt. There is a big link here, uh, linked also obviously to climate change and uh, the more extreme, more frequent weather events we're all experiencing. It's important to appreciate that the Minister is really focused on sustainability and what sustainable agriculture actually looks like. Uh, he recently hosted two roundtables for brainstorming on this issue, if you like, uh, with key stakeholders. Uh, I was invited to attend the first one and there is an ongoing discussion about what does sustainable agriculture look like. Uh, and whether it's feasible, practical to achieve that goal of 100 billion by 2030. And there's a, another whole debate associated with that about carrying capacity of the planet, I guess. Um, at uh, World Soil Day breakfast that my office hosted in conjunction with Soil Science Australia, the Soil CRC and Soils for Life uh, last December, I was really pleased to hear the minister say, Awareness of the critical importance of soil is strong and growing across a wide range of sectors. And importantly, uh, and we hadn't heard it before, the Minister affirmed uh, the new government's uh, support for the national soil strategy developed by the previous government. Very specifically, he said, the National Soil Strategy released in May 21 was a good start. Our government is now already taking the next step. The draft National Action Plan gives us a new path to improved soil condition. A new path. Now, I don't know how many people in this audience uh, have a copy of the National Soil Strategy on their bedside table or have actually looked at it. Uh, you can just go online on the DAF site and download it. But it's actually, uh, it is a very readable document and I do commend it to you. Um, I do know that your organisation was among the organisations consulted on the strategy's content and that you submitted comments. Uh, and I was also asked uh, last night, what's happening about the plan? Uh, so although I don't speak for government, uh, I am independent, I advise government, I have access to government, 
I have the ear of government, but I am independent and I don't speak for the government. But I, I do think that if you haven't, you should have a look at it. It's really, it's well set out with excellent case studies and it contains, it's a 20 year strategy that uh, sets out a vision for Australia's soils. Uh, it defines several key goals and then cascades down into a range of ob objectives. Now, I'm not going to pretend that this doesn't contain some clunky bureaucratic language, but some of it is just absolutely music to the ears of people who care about soil and want more attention paid to it. The vision for the strategy is that Australia's soil is recognised and valued as a key national asset. Magic words. A key national asset by all stakeholders that it is better understood and sustainably managed to benefit and secure our environment, economy, food, infrastructure, health, biodiversity and communities. And then there's that sort of little bit of bureaucraties now and in the future. Uh, but it is a good vision, it's a strong vision. And the three principal goals, prioritise soil health, empower soil innovation and stewards, and strengthen soil knowledge and capability. Very clear and I think hard hitting, but of course in any policy and strategy document, it's all about the implementation and the commitment to implementation. And that is where the National Action Plan comes in. Uh, this is a plan to be done every five years and uh, it is meant in consultation with the federal and state, uh, the state and territory governments, all of whom have endorsed this, were consulted on it and have signed on to it, so this also is a first for Australia. Uh, but they have got to get behind it and they have got to align some of their policies and actions and resource commitments, financial commitments, to help make this strategy work. The action plan is being drafted by uh, the soils team in the Department of Agriculture. They're advised by a high level steering committee of which I'm an independent member and a working group, that's the real engine room and that's where uh, Sue, my policy advisor, plays an active role. Uh, a first draft was put out for consultation, public consultation between September and November last year and uh, I don't know whether you contributed to those, but uh, there was a big, a strong response, again very encouraging, uh, 70 real uh, submissions, really solid ones, were received that indicated strong support for the strategy and for the plan, but with a very clear message. Soil stakeholders want it to be genuinely an action plan with clear, measurable steps for action over the next five years. Uh, in mid-December, the advisory bodies met to talk about some priority actions uh, and we were asked to provide comment by early February and we have been waiting since then for a new draft and a new discussion. But, you know, things like emergencies and Christmas and holidays and Senate estimates and a May budget and many other pressures on the government, I understand absolutely, plus a lot of machinery of government changes uh, has delayed it. But I also said to the Minister, we shouldn't rush this, we have to get it right. Uh, so I'm not too concerned about that delay. Uh, that said, I was very pleased to get a message earlier this week that we're going to meet in early April to discuss next steps. So it's still a watch this space situation and I can't answer the questions that uh, the Catchment Management Authority staff were asking me last night about what's going to happen, but I do know 
that uh, once a draft is finalised, it'll go to Minister Watt for endorsement and then he'll write to all the state and territory ministers to get their sign on. And I think it will... Um, we should be imagining something before uh, the end of the financial year and maybe the May budget will give us a bit of glimpses on that. Um, there's another thing I was, I was telling you about some of the things that I've picked up in the comments that I think are really important from policy and decision makers. Uh, and uh, in the action plan, uh, it's going to set out how we can improve soil extension services. I hear concerns about extension all the time, and I feed that back. Uh, Concerns about improving soil monitoring and better sharing data. Uh, it's meant to outline how we can increase investment in soil research and development, how we can improve engagement and coordination between researchers, government landholders and indigenous peoples. And there'll be a section on how to support farmers and land managers to change practices that improve soil health. That's absolutely fundamental. It is, from my perspective, a crucial component if we're going to achieve the goal of my speech topic of conserving and improving the health of Australia's soils. And I'm pleased that the government recognises this. Again, even though I don't want to see soil addressed always through the prism of agriculture, I do like this quote from the Minister. Farmers are the front line for sustainable soil management. We need to ensure we are working with them, we are learning from their innovations, and we are supporting them to be good soil stewards. I think that's a really strong message and one uh, that I'm looking forward to being able to reinforce and uh, provide further messages to the Minister uh, after having listened to some of the other speakers today and in particular uh, hearing about what this community is doing. I really am encouraged by the attention that is being given in this region and by the achievements that you have chalked up. I do think um, that there are a range of areas uh, and other priorities that have been identified by the government, not only in the ag sector, that offer the possibilities of paying more attention to soils. And I'll, I'll end on this. I don't have time to go into them and I'll be happy to talk further about them in the corridors or over morning tea or whatever. But um, when you're trying to find how can we get resources committed in a practical way, you need to identify the sweet spots. What are the things that are prior obvious priorities for the government? And there are a whole range of areas in other departments and agencies and sectors that clearly are demanding a lot of attention. And just have a think about these ones. Uh, emissions reduction policy and climate change, uh, the subject of soil organic carbon and storage of carbon and measuring carbon and how to keep it in the soil is something that we crack our heads over the whole time. But uh, it is clearly an area of high priority for the government, so that's an area to be honing in on. Indigenous issues uh, is another. Uh, Drought resilience. Now, I know it seems a bit weird to be talking about drought resilience when you've been having floods, uh, but we should be tapping into the government's clear wish to build resilience to drought and to commit more effort and attention to addressing the impacts of extreme weather events and to building resilience against them. Uh, you all know about the drought fund and there is clearly funding in a ver various ways uh, that it's going to be addressed, I suspect, increasingly to addressing um, all of those, not just drought, but the impact of floods and how 
uh, to build resilience uh, for, because we, La Nina is ending. We know uh, the other is coming. So we have, we have to be looking at that. And then finally, the area of Australia's competitiveness as a trading nation and the quality of its food and products. There is a huge amount of attention being given to the issue of standards and certification and uh, the green uh, production of food and fibre. And uh, I know that that is a big preoccupation and it's only going to get bigger. So there's just, there's just a few little bits and pieces of things that I can see as someone who has been involved with the development of public policy for six decades, uh, I can see that there are angles where we can say soil matters and attention to soil matters. And then the final one I'd, I'd add in is much more needs to be done about making the link between soil health and human health. Not quality products, but actual human health. And uh, so I have a big agenda and a lot of things uh, that need to be pushed and promoted. Uh, and I hope, as I say, that I will have the benefit of learning a great deal from the opportunity of being here today. I hope you have a terrific forum. And thank you very much for being patient and not throwing frogs at me, Jonathan. I heard that uh, one of the ways that they tried to get a speaker off the stage at some other agricultural or sustainability conference was to throw fake frogs at them. So I'm happy not to have had a fake frog thrown at me. And I look forward to talking to you all further. Would you be yeah. Thank you. Questions. Thank you so much, Penny, for those thoughts, um, some of the directions. And I love the fact that you said tie soil health into all the other strategies that our mm. governments and leaders are there too. Um, we have got, according to me, probably no time for questions, but I think this is the only opportunity that we will have to have the uh, National Soils Advocate in a room where you can ask a question. You've been naughty. Slido is completely questionless, so we're not engaged online, but that's okay. And to anybody who's watching from the comfort of their own home office, you can ask questions, of course, on Slido as well. But before I ask my questions, would anybody like to talk and ask a quick question of Penny? We do have some questions. Now, don't forget, because we are broadcasting, you need to be on the microphone coming through here coming through there, so thank you. Um, um, the question I'd like to ask is, if a, per if a person has to look after animals, they've got to um, run the animal under the guidelines of the RSPCA kind of system. Mm. People who own land, do we have, should we look, uh, have to look after the soils under a, you know, RSPCA kind of, system, you know, like, or a, you know, a, you know, a responsibility kind of system? And should we have that kind of guideline for people who own land? Oh, that's a, a very big question. I mean, the, the issue about integrated management of soil, water, vegetation and animals as, uh, was something that my predecessor uh, in the advocate role uh, really drove very firmly, but I, I don't think that there has been much attention given uh, to having guidelines uh, on managing your animals on farm and the link between soil health. I, there has been some work done on it in the EU, uh, and one of the things that we need to do is to watch very carefully what sort of legislative requirements, and there's a new soil legislation being promulgated by the EU, uh, being brought in uh, in relation to certifying treatment of animals. I think that that is certainly part of the mix, but I don't know uh, that there is any effort underway in Australia to make that a part of the regulation and management uh, that farmers have to comply with. Well, Richard? We, so I was going to say, were you turning that question upside down where we do have guidelines on the 
ethical treatment of animals, I'll use an organisation's name for that, but to the ethical treatment of our soils so that, you know, as, as, as people who are stewards of our mm. soils, should there be guidelines and, and should a, a land manager be taken to task legally or otherwise for mistreating their soils? Look, the, you get into the carrot and the sticks debate and uh, although I would having been Governor of Queensland and, uh, and dealing with barrier reef issues and seeing the impacts of uh, uh, practices that aren't good, uh, I do think that there is scope in some areas for regulation, but I would much prefer uh, not to have, have the stick approach, but to have uh, incentives uh, for people to do the right thing, if you like. Um, maybe linking it, um, and I'm puzzling over your question, and I'll, I'll have to give it a lot more th thought, um, but uh, the whole issue of soil biology has, is moving up the agenda and soil biodiversity and keeping all of that going. Peter might be able to talk more about that. Um, maybe is a dimension, but no, I don't, I don't think there should be sanctions. There should be incentives and encouragement, and then that brings you back to knowledge and awareness of why this is important. And for farmers and land managers, it, it, there's a big end point of productivity and profitability, not just doing the right thing by the environment. Uh, so you've given me a puzzle. I'll have to think further on it. Richard, you had a, a, a question. Are we still all right? And then you want me to get off the stage. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, my question is about soil security. So security is a word we hear every day at a policy high level. And uh, we also take it down to particular topics like food security, water security, energy security, probably housing security too now. But soil security seems to me a wonderful uh, moniker or catchphrase to bring to the same level as water security, food security, energy security, because it's actually linked to them. A lot of our water security does depend on the soil security. I wondered how far that kind of language is actually being used. I'm sure it is, because you're it very is. competent. Um, it, soil has been moving up the policy agenda nationally in Australia and in particular globally. Uh, and there is a, a very significant, if you like, academic debate ongoing about the, on, at the moment about what actually is the concept of soil security. But uh, it is making, and then there is a big congress uh, in June in Korea, the first, fourth world congress on soil security. Uh, about this to try to advance it. There's no doubt that the UN is um, very active here, uh, particularly the UN Environment Programme and the FAO and the Global Soil Partnership, which is an informal network. Um, I'm an independent member of it. Uh, international network, which is focusing on, in particular, the connection with food security and energy community. No, uh, security. Uh, it hasn't yet uh, settled into something that there is agreement on, but the key thing is just make, connecting the dots and making these connections that soil is an absolutely critical part of addressing the big global challenges. Uh, and that's predominantly climate change and food security, and that's why the subject has moved up national and the international agendas quite clearly, because people understand that you know we're really at pretty much crisis point. Mm. You had one. I, I was going to say, Penny, after haranguing people to use the online questions, I better ask one of those <laughs> or the people there on the screen behind you. I'll combine Beverly and Sally's point, which is that we're kind of preaching to the converter today. Exactly. How do we get that general populace behind a uh, sustainable and 
a, a sustainable soils strategy? You have to work through a whole range of tools. Citizen science is a really, you know, of that whole movement is really important. Uh, you're all familiar with the gardening community. Again, that's preaching to the converted. They know that. Uh, but uh, they are people who are living in our urban communities who are able to influence neighbours. You've got to get into the schools. Absolutely get into the schools because, you, you know, some of you here um, of comparable age will re remember just what a big influence kids had coming home and saying to the parents that, you know, don't throw rubbish or don't smoke or don't no. Uh, and I, there is a proposal, and Michael Jeffrey pushed it hard, that we should have a, a garden in every school. Uh, I've been last week to Questacon talking to them about science communication, and uh, they, they don't have, um, they have very heavy emphasis in Questacon uh, on physical, uh, but not on uh, soil and biological sciences and I'm trying to encourage them to have some interactive uh, events but um, or, or what do you call it uh, resources for, for the kids. The, the issue of urban though is really important uh, and one of the things uh, that I have worked hard to encourage um, is the formation of a parliamentary Friends of Soil group. There's uh, in the federal parliament and uh, there's a new one being formed also in the South Australian parliament. I don't know whether you have one in Victoria. But uh, that the former parliamentary Friends of Soil group was dominated by rural uh, representatives of rural electorates uh, and regional electorates. But uh, I said, we have got to bring the urban uh, representatives into this. And we now have a much uh, a, t a group that is twice as large as the last one and that has a good balance geographically. Uh, these are um, bipartisan, non they're all politicians, but um, they are people who care about the issue. And so it, there isn't party argy-bargy, party political argy-bargy going on. They're just people who are trying to promote soil. So um, the, there are a lot of soil issues in our urban environments that need to be addressed, uh, whether it's soil on golf courses or on playing fields. Or, I mean, there's just... A, how long is a piece of string? There's, there's so much that, that needs to be done. Uh, and maybe it's not the sort of thing that this audience here in this region thinks about, but it is very important. And I haven't answered the question about how you engage other than through some of those really basic things. And I do think the education dimension with the kids is a tremendously important one and the citizen science. And I'll talk to you in the break. I can see that uh, you wanted to talk. Oh, oh, sorry. Wow. Thank you so much for all of that information, Penny, and um, giving us, I guess, some hope that we are getting those tentacles into those other places that don't understand soil is so important. We have some small tokens of our appreciation for you being here today, and can you please thank um, Penny Warnthorpe. Thank you very much. So, oh, sorry. Petty just said, I hope I didn't steal any other guest speaker's time. No, you stole our morning tea time, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to take a short break now to recharge coffee glasses, um, to reflect on some of the Slido and other questions that were asked as well, because um, this coffee is not actually about just caffeinating, it's actually about now reflecting back to each other. Perhaps some people you don't know, what we've been talking about. But uh, I'll come and tap you all on the shoulder in about 20 or 25 minutes' time, and uh, we'll get cracking with our next guest speaker. Thank you. OK, you've all seen Field of Dreams, haven't you? Kevin Costner building a baseball diamond, and they said something along the lines of, build it and they'll come. Well, this morning, it's Jonathan, stand up here, speak and they will come. So hopefully the sound will get everybody away from the scones and the fresh delicious fruit and the coffee and all those things that make going to conferences worthwhile. But 
if you're wondering why are there so many gaps in this sold out conference, you'll be pleased to know there are around 55 people on the stream, which I think is extraordinary. So turn around, have a look at the green light and say hello to everyone who missed out on the amazing scones. <laughs> For the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we are going to be drilling down into our soils. In fact, this session is simply called Exploring Our Soils. And the person who's been asked to uh, present this is probably well qualified to do it. Do you mind, Peter, if I just go through the spiel? You ready? Deep breath. Peter... Um, Peter Dalhouse is a senior research fellow with CERTI, the Centre for E-Research and Digital Innovation. He holds a Master's in Engineering Geology and a PhD in Hydrogeology and has a comprehensive knowledge of the geology, geomorphology and hydrogeology of southwest Victoria, where he's been influential in applying his scientific knowledge to direct policy on things as diverse as salinity and soil health management. He's been an author of catchment action plans and strategies, municipal planning overlays, to name a few. Peter is well known as a science communicator by community groups and as an advisor to catchment management authorities, water authorities and municipalities in the region. With his colleagues at the Centre for E-Research and Digital Innovation, I'll say CERTI next time, I promise, Peter's current research focuses on, guess ready? This is cool. Spatial data interoperability and visualization to ensure that natural resource management data, information, and knowledge is globally available to researchers, government agencies, municipalities, and the public, which ties in beautifully what Penny was talking about at the end of her conversation. If you can't see it in an easy way to understand it, you'll just put it in the too hard basket. So, with all of that, Peter, please come to the podium and podium and talk. And don't forget, we have Slido operating. And for those people at home or in the office or in the Ute or wherever they are, do use the Slido Ask Questions. Not all of the questions will be asked in the forum, but every question you ask is being actually collated and will inform some of the results and the thinking of the uh, conference um, organizers the CMA at the end of the day as well so just because we ignore you today doesn't mean that you're not important okay thank you very much Peter so this year uh, it actually marks uh, 50 years since I started mucking around with soils and um, 35 years since I've been at uni, so that's, that's why that sounds impressive. It's just because I'm old. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take a moment just to... Um, where's my slides here? Take a moment just to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet and, and those on which Federation universities' campuses are located. So we, we pay our respects to the elders past and present, and extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and First Nations people everywhere. When the English colonists first came and arrived in Aboriginal lands, there were about a, nearly a billion people on earth. And in November last year, we sort of hit eight billion. And so we're over, sorry, we're over, um, you know, 8 billion now. When the, um, and 90% of those live in the Northern Hemisphere, right? So that's one of those pub trivia things you can remember. But, but uh, you know, when, the, when you look at that magenta line there, which is the rate at which population's been growing, in the 1960s, in the late 1960s here, we're up around 2%, 2% growth. And that's when, you know, the Club of Rome and people like that, uh, Paul Ehrlich, the population bomb and so on, really had that kind of uh, gloom about the future. Since then, we've dropped to 1% in our population growth. And so we're, we're going to peak at about nine, what, 10, 10 .9 billion now is the, the thought, maybe 10.5 billion. So why is this important? Well, it's because everyone eats, of course, and, and you know, 90% of that's grown in the soil. 
So what's, what's grown in the soil? Well, this, this is the figures from the Food and Agriculture uh, Organisation of the United Nations, FAO. And um, according to them, we mostly eat cereals and sugar crops. And, you know, the amount of uh, food that we produced 50 years ago was about half of what we produce now, in that sense. And, and what we do produce now has changed quite a lot. You know, so there's a lot more fruit and vegetables in there, which weren't in there 50 years ago. And, and some of those fruit and vegetables are grown without soil. Some of those are grown in, you know, big hydroponic uh, glass houses or, um, you know, particularly in Europe, uh, particularly in places like the Netherlands and in the USA um, where they grow. But, but, but a lot of food's still grown in soils. And so more and more land is farmed every year. So when you look at this, you know, over the last, from 1960 when these figures start, these are downloaded off FAO stat if you want to go and look at them. Um, you know, we, we increase our area of land to produce food by about 2 million hectares per annum. So we've, you know, had to build up over that 50 years another 100 million hectares of land to use. And we've trebled the yields. The yields are in the, the green line there. So production, which is the red line, varies still. Production varies because there's lots of other reasons in there, of course. There's climate and there's, there's you know, markets, there's supply disruptions. You know, the Ukraine war is a really good example at the moment of that, for cereals anyway, sort of thing. And so this is, um, of course, has an impact on soils. And so... Um, these maps were produced, it was the first time the FAO sort of attempted to, to create a map of soil health or soil condition, really, was in 2015, it was done through the Global Soil Partnership uh, and, and these maps were released for World Soil Day in 2016. And they're, they're fairly sort of coarse maps in the sense that they only look at... Uh, the regions around the world, so, you know, North America, uh, Europe and Eurasia, Asia, Southwest Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Near East and North Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean. So Greenland up there, you think, well, nothing's grown in Greenland, that's because it fits into that area of um, uh, North America, uh, sort of thing, of, of that part of the world, or maybe Europe and Eurasia, I'm not sure where that boundary is. The condition is shown, at, you know, as a traffic light map sort of thing. So the soil condition here is, is, you know, very poor if it's red and good if it's green. And you can see here that, and the trend is shown by these little arrows on, in the circle in each of those regions uh, for the trends. So you can see here that, you know, soil nutrient imbalance, which is the highest or the worst condition that we've got, really sits uh, pretty much on every of those regions and it is the biggest uh, problem. The next one would be soil acidification. I never know where to point this thing. There it is. Soil, soil acidification uh, is the next one. So soil acidification, according to the FAO, is you know where you've got a pH that's uh, less than 5.5. Uh, and then, you know, it's a serious problem. And every time a crop is harvested, you're taking you know, calcium away and, and you need to put it back, you know. And so um, the problem's biggest in the subsoil, where about 75% of the global subsoils are, you know, acidic in, in that sense. Soil organic carbon loss is, is something that's in the news a lot. And organic carbon, you know, because we, we have this idea that it's a convenient and profitable way to sequester carbon uh, from greenhouse gases and fix two problems at once. You know, you Im improve the soil because soil carbon increases water holding capacity and, you know, acts to balance nutrients and all that sort of thing. And uh, people suggest it's a way to um, sequester carbon. And FAO says that, you know, 
we've lost about uh, 66 gigatons, that's, that's a billion tonnes, 66 billion tonnes uh, since 1850 of uh, you know, soil organic carbon. Soil salinity and sodification are well known to Australian farmers, particularly in this region and, and down in the Karangamite CMA and other uh, areas as well. I did my PhD on, on uh, dry land salinity. You know, sodic soils, those with an excess of sodium, you know, are hard to manage properly and are very prone to erosion, uh, particularly by water, particularly when you change the quality of the water. Um, and once that starts, it, it creates a sort of a positive feedback loop that means that, um, you know, it's very difficult to, to stop and, and manage. Salinity, you remember that we had a national action plan for salinity and water quality in 2000 when uh, I think it was the Howard government announced $1.4 billion at the time um, to over seven years uh, to fix that salinity problem. Soil biodiversity loss, it's a hard one, this one, because we don't know a lot about soil biodiversity, really. It's a fairly new topic, you know, in soil science. What we do know is that most of it's undescribed. If you go to the soils conferences and listen to stuff about soil biodiversity, everyone's going, yeah, well, you know, there's, there's millions and billions of organisms, but to actually look them up, those millions and billions of organisms, you know, it's pretty hard because a lot of them are still required to be described. And, and their interaction with each other, you know, the, the soil microbiome, it's, it's like people talk about the gut microbiome, you know, as being good for health and everything else. The soil microbiome is also good for, for, for plants and has developed over, you know, I suppose, you know, hundreds of years, maybe millennia for those particular areas. And so it's hard to know... Uh, you know, I think there's an area where we'll, we will start becoming starting, startlingly horrified at soil biodiversity loss. Uh, but when this um, was, was done, you know, we, we worked on what we had. Soil erosion, of course, has, you know, been around for a long time and you think of uh, the 1930s when Steinbeck wrote, you know, his most famous novel about the Dust Bowl of America... And in many countries like Australia uh, and most of the states started soil conservation authorities uh, at that time because erosion was just such a massive global problem. And there were just, if you go back and look at some of the literature, some of the horrendous photographs of, of erosion that was occurring. And so a lot of work's been put into er er erosion. You think of the soil conservation authority work and all of that uh, that was done in the past. And it's it's sort of moved into an area now that people are not that deeply concerned about as they were back then. But it's still suggested, you know, that it's going to, to at the present rate, you know, reduce production potential by about 10% in the next 30 years. Soil compaction is another one that we would know a lot about. Soil compaction, you know, has been long recognised as a serious issue. But the move to minimum till or no till uh, in, in farming has proved this condition in many global regions. Soil sealing. Soil sealing is not one we think about very much. You know, one of my great joys as being a late career researcher in an academic institution is that I get to read a lot of relevant um, uh, literature and, uh, re you know, review research manuscripts and so on. Last week I reviewed one that investigated land subsidence in India. It was, it was looking at the causes of land subsidence in India. Let me quote from that manuscript. It said, in setting the scene, the National Capital Territory of Delhi occupies an area of 1,484 square kilometres. So I had to look, you know, how could I put that into context? Well, it's actually turns out to be around half the area of the Greater Bendigo Municipality. So you think of the Greater Bendigo Municipality, half that area is 1,484 square kilometres, roughly. So in Delhi, it's, it's fully urbanised and it has an average population density of 11,320 persons per square kilometre. 
So the population of the natural capital territory of Delhi increased from 13.85 million in 2001 to 20.2 million by 2021. So you think about that, you think, well, there's not a lot of arable land when you've got 11,320 people per square kilometre. You know, we, we, we just don't see it in Australia so much. Soil contamination, um, you know, it's, it's a serious problem in countries that are really growing fast. And so, you know, I'm reading more and more papers, for example, about soil pollution by plastic in China, farm, you know, the use of plastics on farms and, and uh, it's now contaminating the soil. In Europe, there's around about, you know, more than 340,000 contaminated sites, uh, farmland sites, that is. Uh, a lot of them contaminated with heavy metals or other things because of the use of uh, manures and stuff on, on the land over time. So when you look at Australia's global scorecard, based on this sort of scorecard of FAO as best as they could do it, you know, it's not looking too bad, in a sense, compared to the rest of the world. I just want to make this comparison to the rest of the world. I'm not saying it's in good condition, but just compared to the rest of the world, really. So soil acidification and soil nutrient uh, imbalance is the worst. You know, the condition is fair in world terms, but declining. Soil organic carbon loss and soil compaction um, is fair but uh, variable. And soil erosion is fair but improving. And out of those that are good, soil sealing is the, the declining one. If you've, well, I don't know what Bendigo is like, but if you go to Ballarat now and you see the way that the urban landscape is marching across good farmland, uh, it's pretty depressing, you um, have to say. When you look at um, the latest ABARES report that's come out, which is the one on, um, you know, agriculture in Australia for 2023, um, it's a snapshot of, uh, of uh, agriculture. You can see that, you know, we're split pretty evenly between cropping and livestock, 38% each. 17% in horticulture, 7% in forest and fisheries. We, we use about just over half, 55% agriculture, uses 55% of the land uses of Australia, about 427 million hectares there. 24% of the water extractions produces 11.6% of the goods and services extracts, uh, sorry, exports accounts for 2.5% of employment and 2.4% of GDP. If we look at, say, where we sit in the globe, and this is just taking the wheat uh, as, as one crop, you know, because we produce a lot of wheat. Uh, so if you look at the top 10 by volume and yield, we've come in in volume, we've come in in seventh place behind China that is, you know, uh, producing four times what we do. I mean, France consistently produces more than what we do. In, in average years, we come in 10th place normally behind Pakistan and Canada and Germany, but because it's been such a good year, 2021, we moved up the scale a bit. When we look at yields, we, we're nowhere near global yields in, in the top 10 anyway, so we're about a quarter of what Ireland yields and, you know, a third less, sorry, uh, sorry, third, you know, a third of what everyone in the top 10 or half of, less than half of what everyone in the top 10 anyway, yields. So you have to say to yourself, all right, you know, how come France, 80% the area of New South Wales and twice the population, how come that can grow more wheat than we can. And so you'd have to say, well, it's, you know, soil quality is a bloody big factor there. I mean, I know, I know there's other factors, climate and so on, a part of it, but soil quality is, is massive. So just, you know, when you look at Australian soils, I mean, they are old and thin. They're, you know, for agricultural production, they're low fertility, 
they're water limited, they're fragile. You know. I mean, some of our landscapes are the oldest on Earth. Cliff Ollier, uh, a ge geomorphologist of uh, many years ago, he was saying in some of the, his publications that he was finding landscapes that were 500 million years old. You know, they hadn't changed a great deal in that time. Um, so many of, many of our soils have been exposed at the surface for many thousands of years, which has allowed the nutrients to be washed down and washed into the subsoils and were washed out altogether. And then, you know, they therefore become fragile when they're exposed. So these three photographs at the bottom are just local. This, this one's just around the corner from where I live, in just at Bunningham. And that one over there is um, around the Murrable River area. This one's uh, taken around Quambatook, I think, that uh, little willy-willy there, you know. But it, it just, I mean, it's not to say, even though globally we might be good, um, it's still happening, of course. So by comparison, when you think about the Northern Hemisphere and those, those other countries, you know, that, that have got the good soils, I mean, they were geologically glaciated yesterday, you know. And so a lot of their soils are quite recent. They're, they're thick. They've got uh, higher fertility, more organic matter. I mean, just look at how green England looks, you know, when you think about that. So, uh, so uh, yeah. we'll take, yeah, just take, well, yeah, that's, that's good. We'll take them later. I mean, this, this, this is a, a digital soil map, you know, it's interpolated from the data that exists by CSIRO. This is, comes off the Soil and Landscape Grid of Australia and it it's interpolates soil thickness. So this is not the thickness of the weathered crust, that's called the regolith, that's deeper. This is just the soil profile, the thickness of the soil profile. And it's, you know, it's relatively thin. You can see that most of the soils we've got are probably less than a metre deep. And uh, particularly along the Great Divide, you know, where you look across the Great Divide, I mean, coming across last night, uh, every road cutting I go through, I always look, you know, it's just, it's just a geologist in me. And, you know, it's absolutely true. I mean, if you can find a soil in a road cut that's, you know, a metre thick, it's pretty exciting. I get excited anyway, you know, because I've got something to look at. And, and this, this was the state of the nation in terms of how full the, the soil bucket was last week. This was Friday last week, this particular one. You can look these up any time. These are on the TURN website. And so this is, you know, an extraordinarily wet year that we've had, you know, floods everywhere and, and so on. And yet for a lot of the continent, you know, the bucket's still pretty dry in that sense. So, you know, it's interesting in that point of view that there's, there's some good reasons there about, you know, why that ends up that way. Uh, and if we look at the um, state of the environment report that uh, Penny was talking about, I mean, for soil health, so this, this report came out in 2021, was sort of, if you remember, just kept aside for a while and then... Uh, when the government changed, they released it, and uh, at the National Press Club, uh, uh, you know, Minister Plibersek was releasing it. And, and as, as Penny pointed out, you know, the overall soil health condition for the, you know, on average for Australia is poor and declining. The, in the relatively natural zone, areas like rangelands and those zones where you don't really do much management of the soil. Uh, it's good but declining and the problems there are grazing, climate change, ground cover loss and so on. For the extensive land use zone, that is the areas where you've got, you know, cows and sheep and cropping country and so on um, out in the paddock, it's poor and declining and for intensive land use zones, Intensive land use zones are mostly horticulture and areas where you're growing a lot in a small space, uh, including urban areas. Uh, you know, it's largely nutrient, and it's very poor and declining, and it's largely nutrient imbalance and, and structure decline, uh, soil sealing, that, that sort of uh, stuff. That, that, that report mostly used soil organic carbon as their indicator. And so this is this 
you know, taken off the soil and landscape grid again for the top five centimetres, top two inches of the soil, uh, as a, a guide of what, what that looks like. Now, as an indicator, it's not bad because, you know, soil organic carbon has a lot of um, value in terms of it being a regulator for nutrients and holding water and improving soil performance uh, for vegetation growth and so on. Uh, but, but organic carbon is generally correlated with water temperature and soil texture, particularly clay content in, in that. And so the highest soil carbon you're always going to find in Tasmania, where it's cool and wet and you've got clay soils, you know. And, and I'll just tell you a little story here. In, I, I've got a big project going with Soil CRC and the Vertican Cropping Group was up in Queensland was part of that. In 2019, before the pandemic, went up to visit them and they took me out to a field site where they were cropping sugarcane. And it was amazing to see the sugarcane harvester come and all this stuff spitting out of the sugarcane harvester, you know, the, the cane lengths going into the bin and all the rest of the trash going out. And so you're standing there ankle deep in trash. And I said to uh, the guy, you know, Rob Miller, who runs that uh, organisation, wow, you know, the soil carbon here must be great. And he said, oh, you know, we aim for 1%. And uh, if, you know, we, if we can get 0.8, we're pretty happy. I'm thinking, what? With all of this? And, and effectively, there's, therein lies the problem. You're in the subtropics there, the, 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 the dry tropics. And so this stuff just disappears in no time at all. And very little of it actually gets into the soil. Because it's warm, it's wet, you know. It's, it's, it's just remarkable. So when you think about soil carbon sequestration as, a, as an option, it's not quite as simple as you think. You know, because if you're, if you're a farmer in Tasmania, you're rubbing your hands together, but if you're a farmer anywhere else, you might be struggling a bit. So there is a limit to the amount of soil carbon you can put into a soil based on its geography and, and its kind of soil, you know, the type of soil. Soil acidification, is, so this is the same from the same source, uh, you know, where we're looking at the top two inches of soil acidity. And you can see here that according to the FAO, if you're following their guidelines, everything you see here in red and orange would be considered acidic soils by, by you know, the United Nations FAO. And so, you know, a lot of this, you think, wow, isn't that oh, terrible? But a lot of it's actually happened under natural ecosystems, of course. I mean, you know, the Otways there are red, quite acidic soils. Well, yeah, of course, that's because you know, there's a lot of vegetation that has been growing there for some centuries. And so you end up sort of thinking, of, you've got to think about this in a different way, you know. Soil acidity is terrible for crop production, terrible for farming, but it may not be so bad for the ecology because it's grown on that for, for some, some time. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the ecologically production, productive areas of the world, the Australian continent, you know, it's, it's, it's got some of the oldest landscapes. It's been detached from everywhere else for about 33 million years. You know, in that time, it's, it's developed a biodiversity that's incredibly rich. You know, there are more species, I believe, in the Stirling Ranges in West Australia than in all of the UK. You know, it's, it's those sorts of things. It just gives us this incredibly rich diversity of flora and fauna. And many species are just unique or endemic, not just to Australia, but to little spots in the landscape. You know, there are many species that are developed in a soil landform unit that are... Uh, unique and some are rare and th threatened of course in that sense. So these, these three pictures come off the block where I live, I live in the bush uh, just south of Bunningong at Durham Lead and I'm just constantly amazed at how much ground cover there is. I mean, and, and the ground cover, I mean the soil's barely two centimetres thick, the soil profile, it's just, you know, it's, it's almost sitting, we're almost sitting on rock and yet, you know, the plants and, and uh, ecology that's developed on it is in very healthy state and, you know, is very productive in, in that sense. So this sort of leads me to think, well, what can we do about it, you know? And, and I, 
I've been revisiting uh, a great book that I read in about, must have been the late 1970s. It's a book by uh, um, Ian McHarg. Ian McHarg's a you know, well-known Scottish landscape architect and he was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania for some years. Um, and he wrote this book back in 1969 called Design with Nature as opposed to design against nature. You know. and, and it just really struck me as so simple and so obvious. You know, I couldn't work out why we'd never thought of this before. Well, of course we had. I mean, you know, all our Indigenous people and others knew this, but, but we've come here with a different mindset in a, in, a, in a way. So here I think, you know, here in part of this lies the, lies the solution in these next couple of slides. You know, I mean, understanding the natural processes of the soil, if you understand how the landscape evolved, how it came to be like it is, you know, and you understand geomorphic processes, I mean, why is that valley there and not there? You know, it's, it's there because it's at the junction of a geological unit or it's there because it's a, a fault in the, in the earth or something. It's there because of, you know, some reason, sometimes that reason's a bulldozer or a, you know, a shovel as to why that shape's there, but it really is important to understand how to read that landscape, how soils form, you know, what are the factors in forming a soil, how do profiles evolve, so soil profiles evolve over time, you know, how does soil behave, if, you know, physically, chemically, biologically, and then how does they provide, how do those soil profiles and behaviours provide the, the food and fibre, uh, you know, the ecosystem services, the water services, the infrastructure services. I started life, you know, as an engineering geologist uh, looking at how much pressure the soil could hold to build houses and stuff, you know. So as soil mechanics, quite a different thing. So, but learning how to read the landscape the soil profile, the soil hydrology, the soil performance, and act in concert with those principles rather than against them, you're going to absolutely minimise the impact that you've got on your soils. If you want to improve your soils, don't just go and chuck a whole lot of stuff at them. It might not actually work for, those, for the way that soil works. You know, that's... That's how I see it anyway. And, and look, there are some people doing this, you know, the Ian Potter Foundation with the Potter Farmland Plans, the, the regenerative agriculture movement, uh, the, the Maloon, uh, you know, rehydration initiative where they're trying to rehydrate by, you know, slowing down water in streams and all that sort of stuff. It it's, works pretty well. You know, for, for, for more productive Agriculture, there are some great tools we've got. I mean, precision agriculture, precision conservation agriculture, specifically, is one of those. You know, it, it's, it's, its intent is to minimise impact off farm and so on. Uh, digital agriculture is all about data-based decision-making. You know, I reckon just doesn't cut it anymore. You can't say, oh, I reckon, you know, if I chuck a bunch of lime at that, that'll work. You, you, if you're working with evidence, it just makes it quite different. And resilient agriculture, I mean, resilient agriculture is one that's really been, you know, in my mind a lot. And if you've, if you've read some of the uh, books, you know, by people like Brian Walker on resilient thinking, I mean, this whole idea that once you do something to a soil system, for example, you might put it on a thresh, you might cross a threshold that puts it on a completely different trajectory to what it was on, and and often there's no going back once it's on that trajectory. Once once you've started an erosion gully and it erodes away and all that soil's gone, and putting it back, you can't ever put it back the same. You know, you can you can, you know. And so when you do that, you inevitably, of course, have put it on a different trajectory, and that trajectory might have, you know, feedback loops. That, that may not be the same, well, it probably won't be the same as the ones that were providing the ecosystem services that you were looking for uh, necessarily. 
So there's a, you know, to get this information, there's a huge amount of um, good soil resources freely available. You know, the Australian National Soil Information System, ANSYS, is currently underway. It's a $15 million project being run by CSIRO. And um, it's, I'm not sure how far along it is. It's supposed to be ready in June. Um, there's Turn, which is a, a great one. There's um, you know, Soil and Landscape Grid of Australian Turn. Uh, soil Health, no, uh, sorry, the Visualising Australasia Soils, this one here in the corner is a project I'm leading for the Soil CRC. It's a $1.5 million uh, project. And uh, a big plug to the CMAs, you know, I, I work a lot with the CMAs, a big plug to them because they, they do a lot to get this data out uh, locally. So just the second last slide here, just to say, look, you know, as Penny said, we're, we're being pushed a lot more to come up with evidential-based proof. So sometimes that's pretty easy. You've got to keep a spray diary or you've got to do something to say, yes, this is, you know, um, I've only in inoculated these cattle last week or something, you know, or whatever the case might be. But, there's, but, but it's getting harder because you, you've got to think about, you know, proof because the consumers and the governments are starting to demand this to say, you know, are you improving your soil health? Are you, um, you know, producing carbon neutral produce? Uh, are you affecting off farm? Uh, you know, have you got proof of soil stewardship? The banks are particularly interested in this. NAB banks and others have been working with us saying, you know, when someone buys a farm, how do they know what the condition of the soil is? There, so they, they get independent checks done now to, to work that through. You know, because it's... And so, you know, better decisions are based on better knowledge. And, and the way this works is, you know, you collect data, you collect soil data. You know, getting that soil data together with other soil data and other bits of information about moisture and vegetation and yields and everything else, you know, you structure that data, it becomes information. When you link the data together, it, it becomes knowledge. With that knowledge, you make decisions. You decide you're going to put something on, you know, lime or, you know, phosphorus or something on. And with that decision, you get an outcome. And then if you monitor that outcome and you... You, you know, collect that uh, knowledge, it becomes wisdom that you can feed back around the loop and then, then you've got something to, to mentor the next generation with, you know, rather than I reckon. And so the last slide is just saying, look, you know, we're, we're responsible global citizens. You know, we need to improve the management of our soils. We've got to be better soil stewards. And particularly because, you know, we're, we're signed on to the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations and as a, as a nation and even as a region, we need to be able to demonstrate that we're meeting those Sustainable Development Goals. You know, Australia's part of the United Nations. We're all part of the United Nations, you know. So that's uh, really much the end of it. How did I go? Are you waiting? Do I? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Only 10 minutes. Right. I was uh, threatened last night with uh, being, yeah, being ho hoiked off with a shepherd's crook sort of thing. <laughs> if I... So you're going to finish? Yeah, it's absolutely. Oh. <laughs> Peter, an amazing overview from global to local really effectively. Thank you. Um, I've got lots of questions from that, and I think Slido has been reasonably busy, but I did hear one person sort of just have a moment of clarity halfway through the conversation. So we'll take a couple of questions before we uh, start to reflect on both Penny's and Peter's presentation in just a moment. So inside, any questions? On, do it. Um, yeah, 
Peter, uh, I guess at the last couple of these conferences, we've heard about the, again from the FAO, FAO about the loss of topsoil throughout the world. And we've seen statements that say we've only got 60 to 80 years of topsoil left. Um, when I've gone looking for figures for Australian soils, again, I find that very hard to, to find. And I know that losing just one millimetre of soil can mean anywhere between 7 and, f 7 and 15 tonnes of soil loss per year. So it's not so much a question but a statement that you might react to. So losing topsoil, you know, means it goes somewhere else. But the Earth's a closed system, right? It doesn't go to outer space. So, so where does it go? If it ends up in a sink like an ocean, we've lost it. If it ends up going somewhere else, it's just redistributing topsoil. So you, you've got to think about this in a logical way. You know, there's a lot of alarmist stuff said that, that because people have learnt that, you know, alarmist statements lead to policy change. You know, but I think that it's, it's really something that you need to think about. Are you noticing it yourself? Are you seeing your own soil, topsoil being lost or not? If you are, then absolutely, you know, there's, a, there's an issue that you, you've got to address. So I think, you know, a lot of this stuff, uh, I'm not saying, you know, those figures are not true, but they're often done for other reasons and not thought through. In some areas, topsoil has been gained. You can make it, you can, if you understand how soil pro formation works, you can actually make topsoil, you know, in, in, a, in a fairly short time, really. That's terrifying. you actually saying don't let a headline, headline get in the way of truth. Okay, <laughs> fine, we'll get that. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, would you like to ask a question quickly? Then we might go to a Slido question and then uh, it might be time for phase two. Thank you. It wasn't, uh, it was a sort of, I, I guess, um, looking at the map of um, the chain, um, soil health, um, the global map of soil health, and I suppose just looking at the way in which um, the spread of Western civilization, I suppose, um, and the impact of um, on soil. Um, do you think that uh, there seemed to be a correlation between um, the spread of 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 um, yeah Western civilization and the impact on soil? I yeah, guess absolutely. I mean, you know, when you're China's not not that much different in size to Australia. You know, it's not massively different anyway. But you know, the fact that they're growing for four times more wheat, and if you looked at that map, it was just in a tiny little spot, you know, where they're growing, mostly North China Plain. You know, it's, it's just, you know, flogging the soils because, you know, it's, what, it's the only way they can do it sort of thing. Yeah, so I agree with you. You know, population, it's... it's um, and in a lot of those areas, you know, they've just lost their ecosystems altogether. Interesting, isn't it? Um, while we bring up the screen, anyone else got a question for Peter? Yes, we do. Thank you. Hi. Look, mine's probably more of a comment, but perhaps you'd respond. Um, real estate agents selling property. Fantastic fertiliser history. Been in the same family for generations. Um, perhaps we need to educate real estate agents. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's why the banks are waking up to it as well. I mean, one of the issues that we're facing in the southwest on the volcanic plains is that uh, corporate, corporates get in, you know, and some of them are really good, but some of them are just mining the soil. So, you know, they might buy a, a family farm that's done a lot of work. Um, and particularly if these corporates come from other countries, they might just decide they're going to make a quick win out of it and mine the soil of nutrients, put it back on the market, saying this is a fabulous farm. Uh, and that's why the banks have to, to to now independently check that a bit like they do when you mortgage when you get a mortgage for your house and send someone around to make sure that it's not full of white ants or something. You know. yeah. Very good comment. One more for there. 
Okay. Um, oh, Nate. <laughs> so a, a query I have, um, I believe there's a bit of interest globally around soil being recognised as an entity. So we recognise our oceans, our seas, and they have a voice. Um, I think Crawford from AgVic said, on average, land changes ownership once every 20 years. Soils don't have a voice. Do you have any thoughts about how we can lift it up? It's, it's a really good question and uh, really something, you know, that Penny um, and her office, uh, I know, advocate for. But to get soils onto the same sort of level, and Richard's comment about soil security was spot on the, on the money there, you know, to get soils at the same level is something that really needs a lot of work. And unfortunately at the moment, if you were looking at the state of soil education, it would be very poor and in decline because we've lost so many uh, so soil departments through universities and, and you know, and so on. So I think that's a real tragedy at the moment and the departments of ags are being, you know, squashed with move, move to smaller governments and all that sort of stuff. So I, I think, you know, the... It has to happen with that education, Nath. I can't think of any other solution. So I don't know whether that answers your question. But yeah. We are getting some common themes to this morning, aren't we, which is really interesting. Um, and that probably, Peter, is a good place to say thank you so much for participating today. We organise... I'll wait for the applause until I tell you to, please. We have got some... Uh, I'll just grab randomly something from here, or shall Tammy... I don't know what your preferences are for plants and um, olive oil or tomato sauce, but uh, we'll just see how we go here. Olive oil and a gum tree. Excellent. Um, that means you can have some fine bread while watching your plants grow at your property. It sounds perfect. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Now please clap. I'm in, I'm in stereo. Um, okay. So what I'd like to do for the next, hmm, I don't have a clock, it's about 10, 11, 10 to 12. So for the next 15 or 20 minutes, I'd like to actually break into small groups. And if there weren't so many of you, and by the way, haven't the seats filled up in the last hour or so? So Penny, I don't know what it was about your initial talk, but you know, or was the traffic really bad on the way down because of all the flood damage on roads? But anyway, lovely to see more faces here now, and of course online. But what I'd like to do now is kind of break into breakout groups without moving too far. So to do this, I'm going to ask row number two, because there's no one in row number one, to stand up and turn around, and row three to stand up, and have a little conversation within each that. So we'll then alternate that as we go. So don't move too far from where you're sitting, so it's easy to get you all back, so we're not going outside. But then maybe have a think about some of the questions that we've had already, but also just, you know, talk about the key highlights and the key messages that you're getting and see whether or not uh, other people have got a thought that hasn't quite crossed your mind. This is the kind of stuff I love because, you know, I, I'm very good coming to a conference and I think this is the flaming sword of what change that we need from this and then someone will say something and I put that sword away and I get another one out, but there's so many... Can I dare say that we use the word learnings that we are getting a hint at today? Let's share them. So, for example, I've got Joe and Jess and the gentleman in the blue vest and the three people behind you, group one. People in army jacket and blue top and the guy with the colourful lanyard join with a couple of other people behind you, group two, etc., etc., etc. And then we're going to ask one person from each of those groups to share an insight. So this is not just a chin wag, this is work. Get to it, please. Thank you.
Okay, everybody. I'm calling you back already. I'll start calling you Danny Boy and say that your seats, your seats are calling. And it seems like the soil people are the ones talking the most at the moment, so to be expected, but not necessarily to be encouraged when we're getting you all back to your seats. So if you can all take a seat, we, we might just... Maybe you'd like to say who you'd like to share comments from your group with as you sit down. And we'll get a few comments here. But also, particularly if you are on Slido at home, or if you think your points of view are not going to get discussed straight away. Hang on, you lot. Oi. Now. I've been calmly sort of just filling in time while I let you finish your conversations, but you're still going, Peter and Laura. Sit down, please. I think we're going to have to. You, you give some people 45 minutes to have a chat, and they're still going during the uh, rest. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> That's Sorry is not going to cut it, you know. I'm thinking of how much time you're not going to have for lunch now. Sorry. Everybody... I think it's really encouraging the burble that happened during that time. Some really good conversations, I'm hoping, about soil health and maintaining soil health. And even that big question, what is soil health? Someone said to me, what do you think soil health is, Jonathan? Your definition is different to mine. Ugh, it's big, isn't it? So, now you're all seated. I have got Joe and I've got... No, I don't. Yes, I do. I've got Joe and Mel with microphones. If you are the kind of person who likes to vocalise 10 minutes of conversation into one key point, 
there should be somebody over there taking them. Also, please use Slido. Um, if you've got a point of view but you don't like to stand up and talk, everything that's raised today will go into the database. Uh, the lovely thing about the CMA is that they are about action from conversation, not just conversation means mission accomplished. So a dot point that you think needs to be shared could be added to three other dot points and suddenly there's a project. So don't think that just because it's not being talked about now it shouldn't be talked about. Slido is the way to go. We'll put that um, URL, oh there it is in the corner. Do log in if you haven't already. Um, Joe, do you have somebody up there that is prepared to say something? It's thrown in the deep end, isn't it? <laughs> it was mainly we were discussing the uh, uh, soil health with the sins of our fathers in the past. What they did by denuding the trees, denuding the land, how do we fix it this time? And uh, that's what we were coming up with. Okay, so we, uh, we've been unfairly left with quite a difficult baseline. If we could just go back 200 years, it might be an easier conversation. <laughs> no worries. Hello. Hey, um, people might contradict me. I think we were arriving, after a good chat, um, arriving at um, better metrics in helping farmers and landowners understand what their land could be doing compared to doing better than they were doing previously, or really understanding what the um, constraints they're dealing with and whether they're going forwards, backwards. Yeah. So do you mean something along the lines of it's been a mixed ag farm for four generations, it should always be a mixed ag farm, or is there a better way to utilise this land and this soil to maintain its health and its productivity, is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, I, I guess it's a, the pennies figures about most farmers thinking they're doing well against the other data suggesting that, you know, things aren't yielding where they could be yielding. So just yeah. help people understand whatever your farming system is, what's holding you back, and particularly around soils, what's holding you back. That, that was a line that struck with me from Penny's presentation as well. Um, who else has got a microphone? Maybe, why don't you start looking over that side, Joe, while Darren finds a, vi uh, I mean, a contributor from over here. <laughs> no, we've got one here. Sally. Uh, we, we spoke about um, there's a balance that we need to strike between um, preserving the soil and the need for the growing population to eat. Um, so there's a risk that we might um, lose biodiversity um, while we walk that balance, um, and then uh, we have uh, we have uh, horticulture and broadacre over here. So uh, we were talking about the challenges to scale up um, and the different challenges around um, soil preservation in both of those industries. Yeah, thank you. And now over to this side of the room. Hello. Yeah, um, we had a really a vibrant group here, and so we've got more than one point. Um, the, but I'll say them really fast. Uh, the first one was don't wait for government dollars. It just happens, it takes too long, just do it. Second was linking human health to nutrient density of the foods. And coming back to Bill's point about... Yeah, patient. there's there's similarly a, a Slido point on that too, yes. Um, the finance sector is now starting to internalise risk, that's the banks and insurance companies, of harmful practices. Um Next point was better education information, both to consumer and on-farm, such as uh, bring back the extension services. They worked very well in the past. Um, second last point was regulation versus market. It's a tension between the two. I don't think we do it very well. We could do it much better. And what is the market? That leads then through to the last point, which is how do you overcome the domination of vested interests? Yeah. They're all very, very good points. And... The, that'll be taken up in a recording, won't they? So, Tammy, you can add them to the mix. Excellent. Don't wait for government dollars. I, I guess that's kind of what we're seeing with some of the things we'll be hearing about this afternoon, isn't it? Is that we've got farmer groups that aren't getting huge numbers of dollars to trial change, which is going to be really good to hear. Anybody else got another thing to say? Phil, of course you do. <sighs> Look, I just want to say here, I just had a microphone shoved in my face, okay? Oh. 
So I, I guess the point that uh, the last point that we discussed is the one that I touch on, and that's the fact that we should be starting with our kids and doing far more education in schools um, about all the things that we've we've talked about. Okay, yeah, start starting. At that level. It was interesting, Penny was saying that we would look to have a food garden in every school in Australia. And I had a reflection on that. And one of my jobs is to liaise with primary schools in my catchment, which is the Greater Long Gully area. And I cannot think of one school that doesn't have a garden program. Some of them even have chooks in an urban, fox ridden environment. So I think there is that commitment to teaching our children that food doesn't come from a supermarket, which is amazing. And now we've got somebody volunteering. I love it. I'm just going to make a comment right on teaching um, and education. I'm a teacher. And I'm in a school that was the most recent state government build, biggest funded school in the state ever. They didn't factor in any agriculture into the new build. We've had to just create it now, post-build. Interesting. And it gets back to everything about roles of um, soils advocates and all that stuff, is that why wasn't it front of mind for the bureaucrats who were funding and designing? Interesting, isn't it? Um, thank you, Mel, for doing all the stuff on the, um, on the whiteboard. Did you say, Joe, one more comment? Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, prompted by uh, Peter's question to one of the audience over... Um, what's the condition of your soil, your, is your soil degrading? It's recognising that being aware, being able to see soil de de degradation or soil loss is actually really difficult. So it's so important that we're constantly monitoring our soil. Um, i just throw a reference to the North Central CMA Soil Health Book, which is a summary of the visual soil assessment as, as, a, as a tool that could be used. And one of the our, our group... Um, has a star picket in the paddock, so it can uh, and regularly monitor that, visually taking photographs and seeing if, if any changes occurred. So that monitoring is really important if we're ever going to notice that soil degradation is occurring. Um, and the other comment from our group was the importance of, of increasing diversity and increasing ecosystem function um, through either things like multi-species forage crops or, or, or cover crops in a cropping system. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, and including uh, these aspects, soil biology in particular, uh, in a, in training of agronomists. Mm. Uh, that seems to be a gap that uh, still that remains. Yeah, it's interesting. I think this afternoon we will be talking a little bit about community building and the fact that in some ways um, extension officers and some other paid people in the past have been able to contribute to that idea of creating critical masses of primary producers to look at best practice and to implement that, that's gone. What comes in its place? And again, from the outside looking in, seeing what the work of some of those regen groups have done over the last four or five years, you notice that you can find some like-minded people, give them some support, and suddenly you've got science and agronomic experimentation going on in a really positive way. So I think that some of your points will actually be sort of covered at a very local level this afternoon and I'm rather looking forward to it. And Mel, what do you reckon with the time that we've got? That's actually a really good point to say, let's move on. And um, we've got a moment now to reflect on a life well lived. And when I was told we need 15 minutes to make a presentation, I wasn't sure what it was all about. But then I did some Googling and I found out that somebody who has lived a very full life that was tragically cut short um, is worth celebrating at the forum today. So I'd like um, Phil to come forward to, to say a few words. I think that um, in Maryborough, the person we're about to talk to is often known as Miss Wiseman from a previous life, but uh, we're going to talk about contributions to soil science now. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, if I could have Dan Mullins come up uh, to stand beside me as well, please. Um, you want me up there or not? 
You can stay there for the moment. <laughs> you pinch your steps. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Uh, as you can see, I know, I know Dan pretty well. Um, and in fact, I, I've known um, both Dan and Diane for, for quite some time. Um, I remember getting an email from um, Ken Weller from Nianga Nursery saying, oh, I just had a woman come in today and she's got salinity issues and some erosion problems and she comes from Mount Miraburra way and I've given her your name and address. And about 24 hours later I got an email from Di saying I've got these kind of problems and I live at a place called Dunloose. And I said, I wrote back and I said, yeah, I know Dunloose. I actually did some work there in the 80s uh, with a guy named Alex Wiseman. And she wrote back and said, that's my father. <laughs> um, and it was the same property that we were talking about. Um, and then we went on. Uh, um, I, I guess we managed to get some money together, and I'm talking about the Northern United Forestry Group at that stage, um, out of a philanthropic um, trust. And uh, we were setting up groups, even at that stage, um, to be self-governing and to work out their issues and uh, some cash, basically, to do some things. And uh, through discussions with um, both Di and Dan, uh, for the Time or West group, we set up uh, a group, basically, out there. And, and then we went on to migrate that into a Farming for Sustainable Soils uh, group. Um, and basically Di became the secretary of the Time or West uh, uh, land care group that was behind all of this. So she turned up to all of those meetings and Di was an amazing community person. So not only was she secretary of that group, but she would regularly put that group in a bus and take them up to Bill Twigg's place or she would take them up to the Sims family. Um, at uh, Lockington, um, or to the, the indeed the field days that the Northern Night Forestry Group were were actually running. So she got totally behind it, <clears throat> and it was about that time I started to think of her as one of our tribal elders, basically. So we we had people, and we still have them. We had people like Trevor Campbell sitting in Donald. We had the hunts up at uh, Normanville. We had the Sims over at Lockington. Um, we had Judy Crocker at Lockwood. Um, we had Murray Dynan, for instance, down at, at Guildford. Uh, and all of these people were the statesmen that stood behind the land care groups. And you wouldn't go into that group, basically. We wouldn't even think of going to that group without having a discussion about, uh, about those kind of people. And I guess when we started putting this together for, for Diane and thinking about it, um, somebody made the comment, I think it was Mandy, maybe we should be rewarding these people while they're around and with us um, at the same time as honouring them uh, when, they're, when they're gone. So anyway, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say on behalf of all of us that Diane was just a fantastic um, community person, not only in terms of the land care stuff, but the, word, the word stuff that you did with the Mirabara Ambulance, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I guess what we've done is just put together a couple of things for, uh, for Diane. And uh, Tammy, where are you? OK, so Tammy can... Okay, so we might read, we've got a plaque here basically that we put together and Dan, you can put this wherever you want to put it, whether it's out the I farm. Do I know where it'll go? Uh, <laughs> good. Um, and it says this tree, um, we've got a tree here basically as well. Tammy, do you just want to show that? We've got a tree here as well and the plaque says, this tree is planted in loving memory of Diane Mullins 
in recognition of her tireless dedication, support and care shown to the community and land care, North Central CMA, 31st of March 2023. Now, I'm going to ask you to say a few words. I will. Can I just put that down there? Sure. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, and I think Diane would be uh, very humble to you today. But thank you for the CMA for doing this. Uh, Diane was passionate about land care for over 40 years. And the word no, she didn't understand that word at all. If someone said no, she would say, why? When? Who? Or how do I fix it? And if uh, some of the uh, people said no to her, she'd say, who's your boss? And go higher up the tree. And I know of four CEOs that got emails from Di. Why can't I do this? Can you fix it for me? This is what I want. And she didn't give up until she exhausted every means she could. She did not give up. And when she finally got to the stage where they said, no, it can't be done, she accepted it, but she never forgot it. She would always try another year later and try and do it. But to uh, the CMA, I thank you very, very much. I'm very humbled. All no right, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. We've um, we got a video now. My name is Diane Mullins. Um, I've lived in the Mirabar and District area for since I was born. Uh, this property is done loose. I haven't lived here, but it is the family property that was settled in the 1850s by my great-great-grandparents, so I'm the fifth generation. My husband and I, or my father before me, has been a member of the Timor West Landcare Group for some years. My dad is 95 and a half now, and he's been in land care for over 30 years. We immediately were involved with some of the Time or West land care projects and we had a renew program out here, a project operating here at this property, at the Dunluce property. And that was almost a springboard for leaping into the Farming for Sustainable Soils program. We're learning and sharing and building. At the same time as building our farming and agricultural knowledge, we're actually building firmer, warm relationships with each other. And that's a strength for our Farming for Sustainabilities project. Not just the soil health, it's the health of the individuals involved too. The Farming for Sustainable Soils project has strengthened our community in many, many ways. Obviously, we have a much broader, deeper, sound knowledge of soil structure. Um, we have a, we've, we've learned so much from our guest speakers, from visiting other properties, so our knowledge base is much stronger. I think the fact that we've built such good partnerships within our community, with other agencies, and it's not just for now, it's for the future. We know we have a pathway, we know where we're going. Um, thank you very much, Phil. Um, 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 um. Is it 12.30 yet? Yes. Yes. So according to my um, wrap-up, a tribute to Diane Mullins, thank you very much too for your kind words. And um, 
Now it's time to have lunch, a working lunch, of course. You're not getting a free lunch. You will go and you will grab food from the trade area and you will say hello to people. And then you do what that gentleman there has done and you'll get the free merch. And while some of that is actually a nice keep cup that holds a lot more than the little cups that have been supplied by the capital. Um, that will keep you fueled up for this afternoon. There's a lot more to get through, some amazing voices to be heard, but there are also some opportunities for, again, to share your thoughts because I'm sensing that the ulterior motive of this is not just to ask a hypothetical what's next in ag, but to literally then create a framework to make it happen. So all of your input is greatly appreciated. Let me stop talking. I'm going to start corralling you at 25 past one and uh, someone's kindly lent me a cattle prod so instead of just a gentle word some electricity might be swapped so we'll see you in about however long that time is okay thank you most people are here multi brownie points thank you so much for much better post lunch kind of entry than post morning tea i reckon by the time we finish afternoon tea we'll have you down as a a properly trained herd or a mob and uh, getting you to do what we want we'll we'll get you to the bendigo show to compete i think it'll be great um before we get underway we start with the fun stuff before you sat down i hope you picked up a piece of paper that's called evaluation survey and funnily enough when they say come to a conference they said free lunch they said free guest speakers of world class they said they didn't say by the way the cost is giving good evaluation that can be used to improve so that's what this is and I will absolutely flog it we'll flog we're going to shut the doors at the end of the presentation no one leaves till everyone's filled one out okay right Welcome back. I think we're getting to the pointy end of the day in that we have heard a lot of people giving big picture ideas about the idea of soil health, how to improve it, how to improve the sustainability of our land, our farms in a ever changing and ever more uncertain world. I was smiling to myself when I was on a gardening Facebook page talking about how one of my crops was not doing too well and a gardener said, mine was a complete failure, never mind, I ripped it out and I'll do better next year. I just don't think too many farmers can have that same mindset of saying, well, I've invested all that time, all that money that the bank wants back, but it's okay, I'll just rip it out and we'll put it, do it again next year. It doesn't quite work that way at a uh, larger farm scale, does it? So we're going to be meeting people who are doing some of that experimentation, some of that learning, making their best of a bad situation and sharing that knowledge in growing communities of farmers and agriculturists. And the first person that I'd like to introduce is um, Jessica Conlon from Runnymede. And Jess, I'm going to put you in the heart of states. We've already mentioned her a couple of times as our Nuffield Scholar. So I think that within the, the SUS Ag um, community, there's a great deal of pride in the fact that uh, someone is going to go across the world or, and has already started some of their travels across the world to see how do we compare? What can we learn from other places? But you need to grow that knowledge at home first, don't you, Jess? So Jessica's going to be producing a presentation today about what's happening on her mum and hers property, Tumbywood at Runnymede in Victoria. Each year they produce around 10,000 heavy lambs. They, they raise sheep on improved pastures, but in dry conditions have had to resort to finishing lambs on grain. They're currently transitioning the farm to more regenerative practices to boost its productivity and resilience. And as I mentioned, Jessica is planning to, or has traveled through Europe, heading to the US and China, as well as other parts of Australia, petrol prices allowing, um, to, to learn more. So. For the next 20 minutes or so, I hope that you'll enjoy this presentation, Three Years of Regenerative Sheep Farming. Thank you, Jess. Hello. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks to the CMA for putting on today and inviting me to speak. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to set a bit of a cracking pace because there's a fair bit to get through, so strap in. Uh, three Years of Regenerative Sheep Farming with... Between myself and my mum, I'm one half of a mother-daughter farming duo in Elmore. 
For those of you who don't know, it's about 40 minutes northeast of Bendigo. Our farm size is around 2,000 acres, uh, 450 mils annual rainfall, heavy red loam generally, and our enterprise is predominantly fat land production. You're a bit um, generous in your estimation of 10,000 lambs a year. It's more like 2,000. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's all right. Um, and we also grow a few beef feelers. So I'm 32. I've worked on the farm my whole life, either full-time or part-time. In 2019, I was working in Geelong as a research scientist at Deakin University. But at the end of that year, I made the decision to come home and work with mum full-time on the farm. So at the beginning of 2020, we sat down and we said, you know, what, what's it going to look like going forward? What do we want to do? We'd heard uh, whispers of regenerative agriculture and the methods involved therein, although we wouldn't have known it as regenerative agriculture at the time. And we just thought that that would be something that would really suit us, suit our enthusiasm, uh, suit fat lamb production. And, you know, Almore is sort of on the forefront of climate change. We can see our climate and our rainfall and our uh, water security changing before our eyes. So improving the resilience of our farm is something that's really important to us. So we started off uh, with the Castlemaine Regen Ag Group, which is funded by the CMA for the last three years and uh, is run by Dean Belfield, who will be speaking later. Um, that was back in 2020. We ended up uh, making our way to the second meeting that that group held, and it was run by David Hardwick, and it was like a total mind explosion. We were, um, you know, blown out of the water. I, I come back from a science background, and yet I was like, man, I'm totally out of my depth here. None of this makes any sense. Um, it was really overwhelming. We'd never heard of Regen Ag, and we didn't know that any of the stuff that they were talking about was possible and certainly not possible on our farm. But the funny thing is, you know, we talk a lot about farmers that are um, trying to encourage conventional farmers over to Regen Ag and how do we do that and what are the obstacles stopping them. Um, but my mum and I were an example of, like, really low-hanging fruit because the only reason that we were conventional farmers and not Regen Ag was because we'd never heard of Regen Ag, literally the only reason. The day we learned about what it was, we changed overnight. It's actually quite, um, it's a bit of a spoiler alert having this photo here because uh, in the middle there is Colin Sice. So Colin is an amazing regen ag farmer from New South Wales. He's a bit of an idol of ours. We'd known about him before we started on this journey. Um, and this is actually October last year. And Colin is holding a group workshop in our cover crop. So to think that that could happen in three years is just amazing. Right, so the first steps were moving from tines, which is what, how we were putting in our pastures, to discs for no-till sowing, set stock into rotational grazing, and monoculture to multi-species. So we just started with the fundamentals of regen. So our strategy was, uh, in the first year, we were going into our worst paddock. It was very tired. It wasn't growing anything. That's it in the middle there. Um, and that's actually after the break, so you can see that the cover is really low, even in volunteer weeds. Um, and so we went in with our disc drill and we put in a multi-species cover crop from Grant Sims up at Lockington. He's been mentioned a few times. Um, this is actually a summer multi-species, so if anyone picked that. Um, but it actually, So the winter multi-species contains cereals, brassicas and uh, legumes, again about 14 different species. Uh, but it, it's not just easy saying that, you know, when I talk about pe to people about what we did, we say we went in and sowed, but it certainly wasn't easy and continues to not be easy. Um, in the first year, we spent more time laying under the disc drill trying to fix it or unblock it than we ever did sowing anything in the paddock. When we got our seed drill, uh, we tried to follow this, this sticker that came under the lid about how you um, organise the settings. The seed wasn't coming out, it was coming out really fast. Turned out that sticker was for another machine. So there was a few paddocks re sown there. Uh, we got all our single super at once. We don't have a fertiliser silo. We put it in the grain silo. 2020 was quite humid um, and it all stuck in there and it wouldn't run through the auger. And so we had to shovel out eight tonnes by hand. Yeah. And it also blocked up in the distrill bo 
box and we're actually still finding lumps of super um, coming out of the drill three years later. So we get it spread by the fertiliser company now. And this photo here is when the straps of our bag of seed, um, our bulker bag broke as we were transporting it. So then it was just stranded in no man's land. So we had to get the generator and make an impromptu seed hopper there. So off to a shaky start. But it was all worth it in the end because we went from this, the photo we saw before, within three, three to four months, we went to this. So here we have, as you can see, 100% ground cover, um, cereals up around a metre, brassicas at 80 centimetres, just phenomenal turnaround from a really tired paddock. Um, we couldn't believe it ourselves. We still can't believe it really. And this just continued to grow beyond there. By the end of October, it was between six and seven foot tall. Unbelievable. So year one, massive growth, as you saw just there. These are some tillage radish. Um, the idea that we can grow radish in the middle of our paddock was something we never would have believed. As I said, it grew over six foot tall by the end. We used no nitrogen fertiliser. We relied on the legumes to provide that. Uh, we just applied single super. And something really interesting that we notice, and we've noticed this for the past three years, regardless of the paddock, regardless of the property, uh, regardless of sheep or cattle, is that every single year coming in to graze these multi-species, we find that the stock prefer cereals first, so they almost exclusively graze the cereals. Maybe about six weeks to eight weeks on, they'll grow for the brassica. And it won't be until the spring that they start on the legumes. And when we did a BRICS test on our, uh, on our different species after we'd started grazing it and noticed this, we noticed that the grazing preference actually correlates with BRICS level. So the cereal was the highest at 12, uh, brassica second at seven, but this increased over time, and the legumes were the lowest. So the stock were preferentially grazing the most energy dense and therefore nutrient dense and most flavorful species, which makes sense. Rotational grazing, so prior to 2020, we were exclusively set stocking. We didn't really understand rotational grazing and didn't think it would work in our rainfall. But these are a couple of photos of our um, grazing calendar from last year. We never had a grazing calendar prior to 2020. And as you can see, we're moving stock um, on average, if you move a couple of mobs in a day, moving a mob almost every day during the cool growing season. We have one property at 640 acres. It's divided into 14 paddocks. So prior to 2020, it would be very normal to have uh, 10 paddocks with stock in them for a couple of months at a time and four paddocks resting. Whereas now, from 2020 onwards, it's actually the inverse and we might only have stock in four paddocks whilst 10 paddocks are resting. Um, and we've actually managed to increase feed production and carrying capacity during that time, which is unbelievable. But I have to stress that the last three years we've been really lucky starting out on this. We've had three La Ninas in a row, so that's a really awesome time to start out in Regen Ag. So it's difficult to distangle this, these results from the high rainfall that we had, so keep that in mind. Soil test results in the first cover crop that I've been talking about today, you see the, the root exudates um, in evidence here with the soil clinging to the root sugars, which is amazing. So in 2020, before we went in with that cover crop, we, put, uh, we took a soil test, and then in 2021, after that crop, we took another one. And this is a percentage increase on the right here. Every single element except nitrogen increased. So by the end of October, this was actually a 10-tonne crop. If you can imagine a 10-tonne canola crop and the soil test that would result the following year, everything would be depleted. Even nitrogen, which has reduced, is only reduced by 16%. And as a reminder, we didn't put any nitrogen on. So all of these elements, you know, 50% increase in zinc, that's come from cycling from the subsoil and unlocking nutrients that were previously bound up and unavailable to the plant. Um, caveat, this is the top 10 centimetres. This year we, are, we have sampled down to 30 centimetres or to a metre and we'll be sampling again after another multi-species crop. 
so that we know if you know, we've had a 20% increase in carbon in the top 10 centimetres, but is that labile, you know, how stable is that or long-term is that? We'll know more this year when we go deeper. But really promising results for a start. Phenomenal. Um, so years two and three, I'm happy to say, were largely the same. As I said, we had three La Ninas in a row, um, massive production of feed every year, crops between four and six foot every year, um, Phenomenal. You know, people were coming around. That's Tom. People were visiting us all the time and driving through the crops, um, and we never got tired of it. Um, the soil was extremely wet, and, and they just kept growing. I don't know what else I can say. They just kept growing. <laughs> um, one thing we noticed which was really promising was less low-order weeds. This is another thing that's talked about a lot in Regen Ag and that we were sort of sceptical about. Can that really be true? The paddocks that we went into had a lot of barley grass. Barley grass is a really big problem for us as an annual weed. Um, and, you know, people say, if you get this all right, it'll just disappear. You know, is that true? Well, after two years, we started to notice that actually that was happening. We'd have massive uh, barley grass seeds set the year before, come in with the multi-species. The following year, it shifted to soft brome, which is still a weed. The seed isn't so bad. Um, but it's a higher order plant. And in the third year, in multiple paddocks, we saw no barley, or, you know, very low barley grass comparatively, lower soft brome and introduction of wimmera rye and clover. Those are still annual volunteers, but that's actually sheep feed now, and those are higher order plants and something that we can make money off. So, again, it actually works. Each year we attempted to put our knowledge into practice by improving upon our synthetic inputs. In the first year, we used single super. Admittedly, it was a low rate, 75 kilos a hectare, um, so not too evil, I suppose. But the following year, uh, we discovered buffering, and so we had that fertiliser buffered in humic acid to mitigate the impact on the soil biology. Last year, we tried to improve again. We coated our fertiliser in humic acid, and we also applied a seed dressing to uh, stimulate the biology and the association between the plant and the biology at sowing. This year we're going one better. We're removing that synthetic input of the super and we're going for soft rock phosphate, uh, known as biofos. It, it, we won't have that same bounce away, probably, with the crop that you would get with a synthetic fertiliser, but the long-term benefit... Um, is touted to be better and also will have reduced locking up of other nutrients, which super is really bad for. And we'll continue with our seed dress. For the last couple of years, um, it's been a bit wet to get on with foliar sprays, but that's something that we're really looking forward to incorporating in this year's program. 4,000 trees planted in three years as part of our whole farm, you know, uh, strategy. For obvious reasons, we're... Um, Bringing, we're looking for shelter, not just for stock, but also for our pasture. That's during heat and cold. Um, we want wildlife corridors, birds, lizards, um, but also predatory insects to reduce the use of insecticide. 4,000 is a pretty big number, and I probably wouldn't recommend it, especially if there's only two of you. Okay, finishing lambs on grass. I actually, uh, in 2022, I was successful in a Nuffield scholarship to research improved ways of finishing lambs on grass. Currently, we finish around 2,000 lambs per year. 25% of those are finished on grass. But we're aiming for 100%. So if we can get a lamb to 60 kilos in six months, we'd be really happy. And that would be indicative that our whole farm system is working. It's not a case of pushing that animal beyond what it's capable of. It's fulfilling the genetic potential by removing obstacles such as poor feed quality or poor soil health. I heard a statistic that um, the best case scenario for lamb grass conversion is six kilos of grass to a kilo of lamb. The current estimates in Australia are 25 kilos of grass to a kilo of lamb. So we're well behind where we could be at. So that's our aim. That would demonstrate improved feed utilisation. We would have improved animal welfare because we're removing those uh, health issues that are holding them back at the moment, which are not to be underestimated. 
and we would have reduced cost, time and labour that goes into grain finishing, as you can imagine. When you're grain finishing, the lamb's hanging around for between 10 and 12 months. So, you know, almost twice the time. And importantly, grass-finished lamb compared to grain finished has a massively superior nutritional profile for the consumer, which is a topic that's been brought up a couple of times today. So this is largely due to the improved omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid ratio in grass-finished lamb, which is anti-inflammatory, um, whereas grain-finished lamb tends to be pro-inflammatory due to a higher ratio of omega-6. So in 2020... We had on some of those six-foot crops I was telling you about 1,200 lambs on 40 hectares for two months, you know, and they never ran out of feed. Um, far from it, they actually they couldn't find the dam, so we had to mow laneways into the paddock so that they could get around. They had 14 species to choose from. As I've said, the crops were six foot tall. And yet at the end of 2020, we had 1,200 lambs still to finish on grain over the summer. In 2021, we dry sowed a few paddocks into multi-species pastures. So in conjunction with the volunteer grasses, in some paddocks we were counting 36 different species of pasture that the ewes and lambs had to choose from. In 21, the crops were at four foot tall. Extended growing season, we've got green grass into December, whereas you know it's not uncommon for us to dry off in October. And increased carrying capacity. We're buying new sheep in all the time. They were very expensive that year, but, you know, we just couldn't keep on top of the feed. So amazing season. But again, a 1,000 lambs required to be finished on grain at the beginning of summer. So what were we missing? You know, this is the type of lamb that we want to produce. This lamb's on a grain feeder. So we're starting off in December. We've got all these lambs on board. The, the grain grass is finished what's happened. We had all that feed. And, you know, I wanted to talk about something so that we could, um, so that we could learn today, you know, some of the regen stories are really successful and motivating and that's awesome, but it's important to talk about the problems as well so that we don't think that this is just an overnight fix. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things to work through, particularly when you're in such a new environment and trying to learn things by yourself. So what are we missing? So I was um, trying to figure out this conundrum, what, what was going on, and I actually remembered that someone from another CMA group from Raywood had actually done a feed test on our cover crop in 2020. That emailed me the results, but I you know, sort of looked at it and I didn't really know what it meant. And I just happened to find it again in my emails and had a look, and had a look with fresh eyes, I suppose, given what we'd experienced over the last three years. Oh, wait, that's right. So I'm looking at this feed test. You know, on the 3rd of we got a feed test done on the 3rd of August and again on the 23rd of September. There's seven weeks in between that time. We can see that there's been some change. The dry matter has gone from 17% to 90%. That's a pretty big jump. Um, digestibility, 37 to 60, big jump. Uh, Metabolisable energy... 12.5 down to 8.4. So the quality has changed, but we didn't actually know what that meant for us. What do we need for fat lamb production? So then I figured out that at 50 days lactation, a 60 kilo twin bearing ewe requires a daily energy intake of 23.7 megajoules. Okay, where were we at? On August the 3rd, if we do a bit of maths, uh, we take the neutral digestible fibre, 37.1, divide that by uh, 120 is a constant here in this equation. So we divide this, we get a U can eat 3.23% of her total body weight each day, which equates to almost two kilos of grass eaten. When we times that amount of grass by the amount of energy we have, we have 24.25% eaten per day and if you remember we needed 23.7 so we're on target excellent what about September we take our neutral digestible fiber again we can only have two percent of our body weight eaten per day because we've got so much increased fiber it's 
physically impossible for the sheep to eat anymore because it's moving slower through the digestive system. So it takes more time before you can fit more in. Now we're down to only 1.2 kilos of grass eaten per day. When we times that by our lowered energy, you know, it's an amplified effect. We're only having 10 millijoules of energy consumed per day. How far off is that from what we need? It's half. So in August we were there and in September, seven weeks later, it was half. And one thing that really stands out to me is that this data was given to me in 2020. But I never knew what it meant until 2022. And that's, I think that's a real hallmark of Regen Ag. You know, it's almost a cliche now. We start out and in the first year we're all reading the same books. We're reading Gay Brown and we're reading Nicole Masters and Charles Massey. And those books are dense and they're filled with answers. Just like this, you know, this was an answer. It was a massive piece of the puzzle. But I couldn't recognise it for what it was. And when we read those books by Nicole Masters or whatever, you don't become an instant success overnight, even though you've read that. It really takes a long time. It takes three years of experience, but also incremental learning and building the foundation behind that so that you can then get to a point where you understand that this was actually really relevant. And that's where Dean's group at Castle Maine has been massive for us because, you know, every six to eight weeks we're meeting up and we're doing a workshop and we're reiterating our learning and moving it forward. It's, it's like going back to school. And thinking about this again, so half, half, half the energy of what we needed. That's why we weren't finishing 100% of our lambs on grass despite that massive amount of feed that we had. This is what it looked like around the beginning of August when it was perfect energy. You know, this is a Jack Russell. The top of his tail is about 30 centimetres. And this is in September, the end of September. Yeah, it's going to head a little bit. There's a few flowers. It's quite tall, but it's still really lush. Like, it's bright green. To the untrained eye, we, you would never have known that that was half the energy that we required. We, required. we thought it was rocket fuel. Oh, yes, and so the biggest problem we realised, and it was helped by uh, a grazing educator that, again, we learnt from through the Castleman Group, Dick Richardson, the biggest problem with trying to finish lambs on grass for the last three years was too much grass, which is frustrating. Right. Still doing a bit more math here, so got six minutes left. I've got to pick up the pace. When did we lose control of our pasture? As I keep saying, there was only seven weeks between those two sampling points, but the difference was massive. That picture back there, in August, the grass was already 30 centimetres. Dick Richardson drilled into us it should be the height of a beer can, right around 15 centimetres. So we're, we, would, we were already losing at the beginning of August because we were at 30 centimetres. It was already on its way. It was deteriorating in quality, unbeknownst to us. And so I found this monthly pasture growth rate assessment. This is uh, kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. And again, this is a resource that was already online, but I didn't know how to interpret because I didn't have the problem or know what question to ask. But now it started to make sense. So... You know, this makes sense to us in July, it's the middle of winter, it's frosty, it's cold, the sun is low, photosynthesis rates are low, and we see, you know, 25 makes sense to us, it's, it's a cold time of the year, not much is happening. And it's starting to move up towards spring where we get to 100 kilos. This is just a guide, by the way, I think it's from New South Wales, but it's relevant nonetheless. Um, and, we get, and we peak in October, and that makes sense to us, so that's what we can see visually. Often in October, you can literally see the grass growing. But then when you look at the actual increase in pasture growth between these months, the biggest increase in pasture growth for the year is between July and August, 35 kilos. It's almost doubling. Again, that's not something we can see or that we would expect. There's frost, there's clouds, um, the grass looks miserable. It's actually growing, but we can't see it with our eyes or we don't think it's very much. In August, we were at 30 centimetres and we were just at the energy that we needed to be. 
And this shows and correlates with what we found that we lost the race in pasture between July and August. So how, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to use that information? Now, we've only got four minutes left. How are we going to use that information so that next year we're not making the same mistake? We need to keep on top of the pasture. We need to stop it getting six foot tall. That was exciting um, and it made us a lot of friends, but actually it wasn't what we wanted, we now realise. Again, another resource online that already existed. This is a uh, calculator to figure out how many stock we can run on a paddock. We decided we're just going to focus on one paddock. We're going to box and drop, box up our mobs and drop our paddocks. We're just going to focus on one and try and keep it short. Oh, no, I revealed something. <laughs> um, and so we go through the process. How much feed did we have on offer in this particular paddock? It was 15 centimetres at the time in the middle of July. We wanted to keep it that way. The size of the paddock was 60 hectares. Uh, this is our feed on offer. How many sheep can we put in there? You know, again, it's used at 50 days of lactation with twins. Going through the calculator, it said we could run 800 sheep on 60 hectares for two months. And mum and I were like, that can't be right. Like, that's crazy. They're going to run out of feed, you know. And so I found another calculator and I did it and it's the same result, 800 sheep, two months. I'm like, all right, you know, the stakes were kind of high because the mobs that we had already had lambs at foot. They were like three-month-old lambs. And so if we box them together, you'd never be able to get them apart again because you wouldn't know who's who. But at the same time, not doing this and the crops becoming six foot tall and not finishing lambs on grass, that was really galling to think about. So we're like, we just got to give it a go. And so we did it. I don't know what slide I've got next. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so we did it. All right, I'll just leave it on this one. We did it, and it was right. We put 800 sheep on that paddock, and for two months, the grass never got any taller than 20 centimetres. It actually went from 15 to 20 at times because it was getting away on them. And those sheep were putting on, we weighed some of those lambs, and they were doing between 330 and 380 grams a day, which is technical speak, but it that's what we were aiming for. Like, that was massive, and we were absolutely on target. That pasture was fresh, you know, it was energy dense. It was exactly what they wanted. And so we are really excited, and we were vindicated. You know, now, finally, we're on the right track, and we're going to finish these lambs. We're going to get, you know, a heap of them off, at, off, off the mum, off grass, in six months. This is them here, actually, at about three months old. They look beautiful. But then... It started to rain and then it kept raining and the sheep were standing in rain all the time. Their wool started to go green, it was rotting. Their feet started to get very sore. They were eating less. The game started to slow down and by the middle of October, we were flooded. For the year, we had an additional 300 mils above average rainfall, so massive. And... <laughs> There we were in the start of December with another 1,500 lambs to finish on grain. We got 500 off, which was good. But, you know, we didn't get there this year. But as I say, we were vindicated in realising what our problem was, a massive part of our problem, and putting that into practice for five months was absolutely working. We were seriously on track. At least we can say with the floods that that wasn't our fault. And we couldn't help that. Uh, so this year, you know, we're coming into 2023. We've got a lot of experience under our belt. A lot of stuff has happened. And we're hoping that with everything that we've got, we're welcoming a lack of La Nina in 2023. And we, we think, watch this space. That's all I can say. We'll do our best. <laughs> all right. Thank you. I, 
I guess that my response to that is basically that um, science-based mm. agriculture at the actual grassroots level is what's gets you through and really supportive networks as well. So that is a really good place to move on to the next part of our conversation. Um, Jess and her family have been part of a sustainable ag group and there are a number of these running around central Victoria or the north central catchment region and we're going to meet four people who have convened some of those groups and this is the dangerous part. We've asked each of them to present for about 10 minutes each. Their jobs are to talk, so we'll get that balance correct very shortly. Let me give you some background firstly. And the rege regenerative agriculture community groups have strengthened the health and vitality of farming communities, delivered on-ground activities that improve soil health, increased community resilience to climate variability, and built social capital. The community aspects is an important part of the project because they bring the community together, create positive farming groups, not only to learn from each other, but to share experiences and provide support to others experiencing similar challenges. It's really funny to have the case study before the words, but it, it's kind of good. The project has supported six groups over the past five years in many parts of our catchment, including Talbot, Castlemaine, Raywood, Normanville, and the two current groups at Sananad and Inglewood. The groups employ a local facilitator that supports them with planning and getting things happening on the ground within the community. The project is an advocate for increasing farmer knowledge and skills, supports decision making and builds confidence to try new practices. The groups have run many events engaging expert speakers to assist in knowledge and skills development. Did you need some skills presenting PowerPoints, everybody? Because uh, that's one thing I never thought I'd see farmers having to do is create PowerPoints of what they're up to. But that's kind of one of the things you think, oh, well, it's the 21st century. The success of the project has been through... Oh, hang on, I forgot this bit. The groups have run many events engaging expert speakers to assist in knowledge and skills development. And I think Brad or someone else went through this data, but I'll do it again. Over the past five years, regenerative agriculture projects have run more than 80 community events, set up more than 40 demonstration sites, conducted over 200 soil tests and produced over 100 communication documents. There. The success of the project has been through the willingness of farmers to get out and have a go at adopting new practices. Establishing demonstrations so they and others can share and learn from their successes and failures. Welcome other farmers onto their property, many of whom are here today, hello, and to learn, to listen and to share their experiences. These projects' success was due to the farmers' getting involved. The project's been supported by funding from the Australian Government. So let me now really introduce you one by one to our four guest speakers. They'll come up one by one to the lectern, do their presentations. Then we're going to have uh, afternoon tea. It's all about the food here. And then afterwards, we'll have them lined up like ducks in a row so that you can then fire questions about their successes and their learnings and their processes. And joining them on stage will be Jess as well. So there will be um, three speakers on the stage, plus Jess, plus one of our uh, guest speakers, Jade, who will be on, on um, Zoom because, well, you'll find out more about that later. The first person I'd like to welcome to the stage is Danny. Danny Pettingill from the Loddon Plains Future Farming Group. But running that group is just one of many things he does as the owner of Firetail Environments. His organisation provides consultation and field services in land stewardship, carbon projects and drone services, including surveys, analysis, GIS mapping and on-ground works at landscape scale. He is the lead landscape agronomist in Victoria for Regen Farmers Mutual. He's a director of Landcare Victoria Incorporated and sits on the City of Bendigo Farming and Advisory Committee. Danny works in that little niche between agriculture and conservation to promote management for biodiversity and production through sustainable environmental management techniques. He has experience in community engagement, education and design across a number of industries and applies these to the development of large-scale landscape and micro-catchment restoration, sustainable and regenerative agriculture consultation and carbon and diversity projects at farm or community aggregated scales. So please welcome Danny to the stage. Thank you.
uh, with that bio, I feel like I've just taken my 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I sent that to you, Mel, but uh, maybe I should have edited that. Uh, g'day, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm here to sum up uh, the activities of our group and talk about um, decision-making in ag tech, which feels um, quite um, relevant after Jess's, uh, yeah, Jess's presentation, actually. So, um, yeah, hopefully I can, yeah... Um, I don't know, at least come up to your level, Jess, because that was some awesome, awesome work that you've been doing there. Um, first, I'd just like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of, and custodians of the land on uh, which we work and live. Um, for me, that's the um, Jara people of the Jar Jar Wurrung country. I want to acknowledge uh, and I admire the rich living cultures, traditions and connections of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, their intrinsic connection to land and place and the significant contribution that traditional owners have made to managing and caring for the country for thousands of years. And I'd like to extend that respect to um, anybody joining us today. So this is our group, um, the Lot and Plains Future Farming Group. Uh, we take in Newbridge, Serpentine, Yarraburb uh, and Kingower in the west. Um, largely mixed farming um, and a lot of family farming. I'm just going to try and move this. There we go. Make me feel a bit more comfortable. Um, the main land use, yeah, mixed, mixed farming, um, predominantly grazing and a little bit of crop uh, and a lot of crop for feed, uh, which is one of our focuses at the moment, rather than harvesting grain and harvesting crop for feed. Why don't we grow it and keep it in the ground? Um, uh, I'll leave that there. Um, so some of the activities that we do or that we have been doing um, are things like educative events uh, and programs, um, looking at soil ecology and understanding soil ecology and the like, uh, and how uh, that relates to your farming practice, but also the um, what we call secondary benefits um, at the moment, but basically your farming and enterprise benefits and being able to leverage off those and, and see the potential. Uh, Looking at year-round cover uh, and closing feed gaps. So, yeah, trying to remove the requirement for um, harvesting for feed and keeping it in the ground, which um, in turn reduces your compaction rates and you're able to manage your soils a little bit more efficiently. Um, reducing chemical use is also uh, important to some of the members in the group, and we're starting to look at that, as well as um, soil management um, strategies and plans moving forward. And there's a strong uh, interest in developing native plant um, or native species planting uh, and utilising that within the enterprise. Um, so uh, we're moving into some, um, some pasture trials, particularly in summer. So we know um, and anyone that's kind of driven through the London Plains uh, just, kind of just after harvest right through to about March, um, if you get a bit of uh, wind blowing around, um, you can often, often see the clouds um, of dust kind of starting to come over Kingower uh, from Bort. Uh, and then through to kind of Morong. So um, we we kind of um, witnessed a lot of that oh, probably three years ago now, uh, where we had some really dry conditions. We were just coming out of it um, into that yeah that wet period that we had. Um, not a lot on on the ground or in the soils, uh, and we had significant dust events. Which um, Phil, I remember you and I talking about them uh, a fair bit actually in that period. Uh, and we're also looking at um, native pasture improvements, so um, native grasses and particularly trying to establish C4s and summer actives um, in that native space has become an interest for some of our graziers. Um, So where does this start? Um, uh, as Jess mentioned, uh, this is we've come to realise pretty quickly this is a journey. Um, and so, you know, uh, as, as Jess mentioned, we, a lot of people start with the Charles Massey or the Nicole Masters or the Gabe Brown or the Peter Andrews or the, you know, um, Simon, um, Simon, Simon Pollock. Um, Pollock? Yeah. Um, David. Sorry, David Pollock. Um, and so all of this knowledge is, is at people's fingertips, but it's about translating that into achievable milestones and achievable practices uh, in a farming enterprise. 
uh, that doesn't mean risking the farm, but uh, is also um, something to kind of build towards and, and have a plan in place to be able to not just uh, minimise risk, but also digest that information appropriately and taking time with it. Uh, and that's something, um, you know, I'm guilty of it. Uh, I think we're all guilty of it when we kind of get to these events and present at these events. We give people so much information and people leave and go, uh, like, they're completely overwhelmed. Where do you start? Um, and there are people, we kind of expect people to do things um, straight away. Uh, and so that's something that we're kind of focusing on this progressive journey. Uh, and that starts with, yeah, um, understanding decision-based tech. So um, uh, soil tests are really big on that, but also understanding that there are networks out there that, uh, that we can start to achieve um, decision-making impacts or decision-making actions around things that are already available to us. Uh, so, for instance, this is a trial here. Um, we've been looking at um, understanding weather station data and soil profiles and also water pro uh, moisture profiles, which then provide uh, an incentive to, you know, everyone gets to that point who that, um, particularly in the drier years, where you're either cutting for hay or you're going to grain, uh, and that's a really big decision in our, in our region. So being able to utilise weather stations to, to be able to look at those soil moisture profiles and be able to understand whether you've got enough groundwater uh, to s sustain that crop to get to grain fill or whether, whether it is better to kind of cut for hay and, and put something else in the ground um, has been a, a bit of a journey for us. But um, likewise, um, this is a, a trial in, in Linelli that we've been looking at. Um, so we've got a farm site here, uh, and this is kind of going to the next step. Uh, we've got the pink section here, um, traditional synthetic fertiliser or traditional MAP fertiliser, and we've got a biological fertiliser in the grain. Uh, March 2020, um, coming out of the hottest time of year, about you know, starting to think about um, seed, um, putting seed in the ground. Uh, we're looking at multi-spectral uh, multi -spectral image here and plant reflection data. So we're starting from the same base. Uh, what this trial, uh, what we've been able to have a, start to have a look at here, are things like we get to August, um, and we can kind of start to understand. You know, we all know an index: red is bad, green is good. Yeah. Uh, this is the point in this particular trial that um, the agronomist, local agronomist, came in, knocked on the door, and said, "Whatever you're doing, you're doing it on that side of the paddock. You're doing it wrong." you need to do something, you probably need this, you probably need that. So keeping in mind MAP um, and uh, the, in, this, in this regard, worm hit. We then move on, uh, this is November 2020, uh, so starting to think about harvest, pulling, pulling grain off. We've actually come up to speed, we've come up to par. Um, at this point, yeah, the grain came off uh, and product, produced a yield, and then we went back. So um, this is the following year. Again, we've done the same, but we're in August 2021. Uh, so we've just hit, pretty much just hit par. Um, this is kind of languishing a little bit. September 2021, we've hit par. November 2021, so harvest, we've act we actually, we're starting to see that um, this side on the MAP um, is, yeah, is starting to reduce in its nutrient value and nutrient density. So the point here and the learnings here significantly have been uh, around um, being able to uh, utilise public data. This is public, publicly available data, opening up this data to farmers. Um, and I tend to... Um, the way I tend to put it is providing, far, like in this case, farmers should be having the keys, uh, not having to charge 150 bucks an hour to hire the Porsche. Um, so it's about understanding this and, and groups being able to understand where this, where this technology can go and the, and the fundamental decision-making tools that, or actions that they can utilise under, under this sort of stuff. Um, this is extended to um, <clears throat> holistic management uh, practices or events and courses and being able to establish pastures uh, around this sort of data and understand where you are. And so, again, Jess, I was really interested to, um, to hear about um, yeah, what you were saying with that. Um, I'd actually like to talk to you a bit more about that, uh, about what yeah, your findings there. Um, another, really key contribu or another really key element that we're looking at, and I think we've got about two minutes left, um, 
So now we've been able to undertake some of this, we're, we're kind of progressing further, further down this pathway. Uh, and so this is another trial that we're about to set up. Um, this has been heavily impacted by the flooding event that we had in 2022. Uh, so we've had to, uh, oh, I nearly used the P word, the pivot word, but I'm not gonna use it. We had to adapt uh, our trial and it's actually provided a, a bit more of a, um, uh, yeah, a bit more of an opportunity for this particular site. But we've been able to take this multispectral work and um, move into the um, chemical reduction and weed reduction um, component of the program. So uh, with the 2022 flood event, particularly on the London Plains, we had a lot of water for a fair while. Um, heavily compact, we've got heavily compacted paddocks now. Um, pastures have drowned out. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of feeding going on. But what we forget is after that flood event, we had no rain. We baked, absolutely baked. I was out at this this very site just yesterday uh, and it took me a whole day to take nine soil cores because it is so hard out there. Um, the penetrometer data that I was collecting, I didn't get past two centimetres uh, with the penetrometer at about 1,000 PSI. Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with. <laughs> um, but in that, we've, we've had pioneer weeds start to take over as well. So we've had significant weed, um, weed stuff occur um, so out of um, complete opportunity and uh, also um, interest, uh, particularly within this trial, we've been able to move down, um, getting, getting um, our species back into our paddocks. Uh, and it's kind of that event that, um, that Charlie Massey uh, and Cole Sice talk about. Something has to go wrong and you've got to start from ground zero to start again. Um, and kind of start to in implement these methods. So we've actually got a really great canvas here and a really great farmer who's really open to that. And um, so we've kind of turned this into a bit of a trial farm. So to combat the weeds, we're actually starting to look at um, some aerial capabilities uh, for, for not just spraying, but also seeding and seeing where that, um, where that goes for us, uh, particularly because we want to try and reduce any further compaction to the site. Um, so um, we're starting to look at that. Uh, and the reason why we can do that is um, we can kind of, uh, this allows us to, whoops, uh, to target weeds uh, wherever they might be through multi-species, uh, sorry, multi-spectral reflectance indexes. Uh, and then rather than putting a boom over the top and, and compacting the ground um, further, we can actually send an aerial uh, or an aircraft out and be able to do that, spot spray it, reduce our chemical load, but also reduce our compaction. Um, Are you giving me the wind up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> the other thing that is, I'm just going to take one more minute. Um, just to summarise, so this is this is the site that we're starting to look at, and we, we're going to roll this out um, throughout the group. But um, uh, we've been able to establish this paddock here as our trial paddock, and we'll, we'll start to assess that. But the other thing that we've that we've wanted to establish is. Um, just being able to provide uh, provide our members with open source or, or achievable um, decision making tools that they can utilise uh, within their own practice and within their own enterprise without paying people like me 150 bucks an hour to do it. Um, so uh, we've been kind of developing some of these sorts of things and developing access to that. Um, and what that that means is we can start to look at this sort of stuff and remodel it so we can, uh, this is our main trial area here, but we can also start to establish um, marginal ground areas, so where um, perhaps yields or um, farming activities aren't as profitable, uh, and then start to integrate that into <coughs> environmental goods and services components and looking at um, what we call the, the surplus or the, you know, the secondary benefits. Um, so that might have something to do with the new nature repair bill uh, or carbon and CO2, um, CO2E um, or carbon sequestration, or it might actually just be looking at benefits on farm that, that uh, you know, provide better enterprise decisions, uh, stock management, stock protection and those sorts of things. So what we can do there is, is lay out a farm and um, with a, like at the kitchen table, so a lot of it's about kitchen table stuff and say, okay, great, you're getting, you know, you, you're, you've got your crop rotation uh, and it's about, on average, it's about this per year. Where are you not making that in your marginal ground? Uh, and that's where we're going to target to be able to start to utilise some of these, um, some of these secondary benefit opportunities. Uh, I won't, I won't bore you on that, but, um, but that's kind of what it looks like. So um, entering into um, decision-making frameworks that are able to establish uh, those CO2Es or, you know, tons in carbon, but also secondary benefits.
Great. Thanks. Cool. Ten minutes. Ten minutes is not a long time at all, is it? So thank you so much, Danny. Um, moving straight into it then, I better say Andrew Borg is here to talk to us about the Cara Cara Regenerative Ag Group. Andrew's been the facilitator there for two years and been the land care facilitator for the Bull Oak and Northern Grampians Land Care Network for three years. And um, it's all about integrating biodiversity into agricultural pursuits for Andrew with a specific focus on the rectification of poor soils and landscapes. And uh, he's currently living the dream on a small 40 acre property 30 k's from St Arnold with his wife Deborah. Please welcome to the stage. Thanks Andrew. Uh, thanks very much. I think I've now got, as I just said to Danny, about four minutes to speak, so I'll try and get through it really, really quickly. Um, as was mentioned, I got this job about two years ago, um, and it came about because I had a group of younger farmers come to me as their land care person and basically asked, could we do something in the sustain sustainable ag space? So we formed a group. Um, it's about a 60, 65 kilometre radius around St Arnold. So that encompasses uh, Donald, Witchproof, Charlton, um, and I'm very pleased that Penny mentioned earlier Wingerlock. That's, that's one of our groups, very proud of them. Pretty much uh, the farming systems are generally as you'd expect over that area. Um, in, in the south and the Highlands area, it is predominantly uh, livestock, mainly sheep, uh, for wool and prime lamb. There's also a little bit of beef cattle there. Uh, we also, in the region, have a few intensive livestock operations in terms of poultry and uh, pigs. Further north and out to the west, it's predominantly broadacre cropping. Rainfall, as mentioned there, it, it varies. Um, 530 mils down in the south, about 400 up in the north. However, this year, um, this past 12 months especially, has been a little bit different. We've had farmers recording anything up to 800 millimetres. And uh, of particular concern, especially when I start talking about erosion, we've had farmers, one farmer in particular, record two events of 120 millimetres in a hit. Um, that doesn't do a lot for us. The soils, um, I'm not a soil scientist, so I'm just going to say it varies across the region. We've got a little bit of everything. We've got, uh, we've got, we've got red, we've got black clay, we've got granitic soils, we've got a little bit of everything. That was um, pretty much formation of the group. We um, called a meeting, we didn't know how well it was going to go, um, and we're actually surprised at the number of people that attended. It's very good attendance. It may have had something to do with the fact that it was in a, in a pub with a meal, but fortunately, most of the people in that photo still have got something to do with our group. Uh, at that particular meeting, we got together and basically with the help of a uh, facilitator and, and, and Darren, who's sitting down the back there somewhere, uh, to start the skeleton of an action plan for the things that were important to the farmers down there uh, for what they wanted to see the group do. And one of the things that they uh, wanted to specifically focus on was erosion. That's um, typical of some of the sites that we've got out our way. Uh, predominantly we have uh, water erosion, sort of gully erosion plus also some uh, tunnel erosion. We also have uh, patches further north up around the Donald area which are wind erosion. And we'll have a look at those in a minute. Uh, this particular site is about 20 hectares of unproductive land. Um, it cannot be used effectively for anything. Uh, the sheep are still running in there every now and then. But uh, predominantly, it's been caused as a result of all those natural processes that, that, that trigger erosion. Uh, the heavy grazing on that, on that property means that uh, when the water does come running down in, in bucket loads, it just runs off and, and looks for the gully. Um, path of least resistance, down it goes, washes a little bit more away. So that's caused by excessive land clearance, um, the land utilisation, and also the compaction of the soil. That site is actually a really interesting one because to the direct north of that and to the direct south of that, um, you've effectively got National Park. 
you've got these heavily wooded areas of uh, box iron bark forest and in the middle of it uh, you've got that. This is one of our project sites. Um, this is going to be a fairly big job. This is where we're going to be trialling a few things. So this is uh, out towards Wedderburn. Pretty much you can see all the, all the issues that, that uh, gully and tunnel erosion cause uh, just by looking at that. Uh, not only have you got the section of the property where getting around the property is actually difficult, that particular um, patch that you're looking at there is about a kilometre long and it evenly dissects the paddock. There is no crossing there for the farmer to get across without walking. Uh, the gullies there are between five and six metres deep. Uh, obviously, loss of productive land. Um, you get the occasional piece uh, uh, livestock in there that uh, wanders through and actually falls in and breaks a leg, uh, which is not real helpful. You've got reduced amenity and property values because that is replicated right across that site. Uh, that, that, sort of, um, that sort of issue. You've got uh, destruction of farm um, infrastructure. Fences are just falling in left, right and centre. You've got discoloration of the water supply and you've got sedimentation further down. And probably one of the biggest issues that we found uh, by talking with the farmers with this sort of thing is their mental health. It's not pretty to look at, it's not pretty to deal with, um, so we're having to find ways to actually correct where we can um, this sort of issue and to make the farmer feel at ease in what we're doing. This is one of the, uh, in the same area, it's another area of um, gully and tunnel erosion. Pretty much, uh, again, that, one, that one's not as bad as some of the other parts of the area. It's about three metres deep. So what we're actually doing in there is um, we'll be starting to develop uh, shelter belts. We'll be uh, doing some different things that we think might help to alleviate the situation, and it's going to be a long job. It's going to be piece by piece. So that one there, unfortunately, we were due to start on that site uh, in the second half of last year. However, our, um, our main excavator contractor spent his time up further north building levee banks uh, to help combat the floods. So through no fault of anyone's, uh, we were unable to progress that as much as we wanted. We did get some limited plantings uh, out on that site. The owner has, and I'll show you some of the, the things that the owner's done, the, the sheep have effectively been moved off as much as possible. There's been some additional fencing go in to try and uh, preserve some of the areas and we're continuing on with, with that. I mentioned before that we've also got some wind erosion. Uh, that's, that's normally up around uh, the Donald area. So this site is at Korak, which is uh, northeast of Donald. Pretty much what you've got there is the, the Lake Bulloak lunette over the centuries, um, especially the last 200 years, effectively blowing across the landscape because there's nothing to stop it from moving. What you've actually got on this site now is because the land uh, in between this particular site and Lake Bulloak was completely and utterly cleared, uh, there is hardly any trees. It is, last time I looked, it was a canola crop. The lunette's blowing through it. At the other end of this site, you've got uh, the sand dune up six strands on a seven-strand fence. Uh, the, again, unproductive land. That's an aerial photo of some of the things that we've been trying to do there just as a little test site, uh, rolling out the coir matting, uh, planting things that are suitable for that area um, and the conditions that we're finding there. You're basically almost down to bedrock there in some places. So we're putting in uh, things like uh, ruby and creeping salt bush, various types of acacia to try and get some nitrogen into the soil. And this was only done in at the end of uh, last year. So we, at this stage, because we're a new group, we haven't really got any um, trial data on, on exactly what is happening with ground cover and that sort of thing in that area. Back to Caraca site. Um, a lot of the, the things that we're trying to do is to um, basically get the farmers understanding what's happening. So what you've got there on the left-hand side is where the sheep are grazing. What you've got on the right is where they're no longer grazing. Uh, there's a little bit of a difference. 
Also on the on the side on the left, the uh, the landowner's gone through and uh, put in some rip lines to try and slow. That is actually a slope, not that you can really see it there. That's actually a slope just to try and slow down the water uh, to to stop it from entering the uh, the tunnel erosion. That's a uh, a different perspective of the same issue, except this time on your left, the only things in there are uh, the odd kangaroo, uh, but on the right is still uh, still part of the grazing land. We've had uh, people like Ag Vic um, come out and have a look and, and see what we can do with the site. This is one of the, um, the lower areas where we can actually get an excavator into to do some work. Um, so this is, this is an area that we're going to be starting to do a little bit of work on. Uh, there's a lot of tunnel erosion there. There's, there's a fair bit of water runoff. And the rip lines, I'm pleased to say, are, are to, the, um, to the south of this on, on the ridge, have actually slowed down that process down there. So that was, that was good by the landowner. Also had, um, again, Agvit coming out there and looking at the sodicity of the, um, the soil just to see how much of an issue we're really dealing with. Um, and as you, know, you, don't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist, you can see that it is actually the amount of erosion we've got there. It's, the soils aren't, aren't fantastic. So almost done. What I want you to do, that was a picture we looked at before. This is, this is what we're trying to do. So that's a picture we looked at before. That's what we're dealing with. There are literally hundreds of acres of that in our area and kilometres of lines which are unproductive. What we have been doing with the landowners is, is getting some of our uh, network members out. In this case, it's the, uh, the high school to get out there and try and stabilise things. The landowner in this case has done a fair bit to stabilise the area. They've actually done a lot of correction work themselves and it's now a case of actually getting there and stabilising the banks through planting of trees. So this particular um, one, there was about 1,500 trees put in over two days by the, um, by the high school students. It's nearly all uh, aloe casuarina and acacia species and that's actually uh, what was there to begin with before the land was cleared but also to, uh, to get the nitrogen back into the soil. What we actually want to get to... Um, is that that was a site that was, if, if you remember that slide a couple ago, that really badly eroded site, that's what that was like about 30 years ago. So it does take time. This is a property we're actually going to visit next week. Um, Stephen Poole, who owns that land, has turned it into uh, wetlands, biocorridors. He's doing rotational grazing. He's got agroforestry. Um, he's got it all happening and he's doing it really well. This is what would like to happen with all our erosion gullies is, is this sort of thing. Um, all the way through his property, the water is slowed down, the water is captured, um, the biodiversity is absolutely amazing. So that is where we're hoping to go. Um, obviously it's a big problem, we're only a young group, but this is, this is what we're trying to achieve out there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, our third speaker is uh, talking to the benefits of building soil carbon in farm systems. Dean Belfield is with the Mount Alexander Regenerative Ag Group and he's been involved with biological farming for many years. He's also a professional engineer and environmental scientist and co-founded Regenerative Australian Farmers, RAF, in 2016 with the aim to support the widespread uptake of regenerative farming practices as a means of rapid drawdown of atmospheric carbon back into soils. He works with farmers to help them adopt more biologically oriented farming practices with a specific aim being to regenerate soils at scale, support increased biodiversity, increase soil carbon, increase farm productivity and profitability, greater climate resilience and increased food quality, avoiding synthetic fertilisers and chemicals where possible. Dean, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. I think when we write those bios, we don't really think about listening to them sitting at the floor, but uh, that's one of the lessons, I guess. Uh, <laughs> great to have the opportunity to come and talk to you about um, some of the experiences we've had in building soil carbon farming systems, and, and it's, I've got to say it's inspiring to hear the previous speakers, actually all the ones this afternoon, 
Um, and seeing that side of the creeks filling full of water, the erosion gullies full of water, is just awesome. Uh, so um, the title here, Building Carbon, Builds Tall Carbon and Farming Systems, uh, maybe I can ask you to make a mental note of what comes to mind. Just hold that thought. Because uh, it's a very broad topic, but I'd be interested to see where your thoughts are at for the Q&A session. Um, a few years ago, I, I was told that... Um, Back in 1842, a fellow called Count Strzelecki, a Polish scientist and a member of the Royal Society, um, collected soil carbon samples across southeast Australia and sent back to London for scientific measurement. These samples yield an average of between 4 and 5% soil carbon, which blew my mind given that what we know the carbon levels are today. Um, so fast forward 180 years to today and based on the measurements in this region, what we're finding is typically the soil organic carbon measurements are around 1%. So logically, the question you ask is, what happened between then and now? What have we done that's different? What are the practices that have been implemented and so on that can explain that? And perhaps you can even ask, well, what's the economic impact been or even the community impact, perhaps in more recent years? So I'll just... I won't read through these, but I'm just showing you there's a couple of fairly useful natural cycles at play here, and I'm sure you've all seen those. If not, you can find them on the web pretty readily. But um, what they show is their respective carbon stores and fluxes in the air, on the land, above and below the ground, and in the oceans. And so to answer my previous question is about what happened and so on, a significant percentage of the carbon in the top horizon of our soils has simply been oxidised, which means that the carbon molecule, complex molecules, they attach to oxygen, they disappear as CO2. So when we say we haven't lost them, it's just gone to a different place, right? And the quick challenge is how do we get them back? <coughs> and, you know, those farming practices might be ploughing, fallow, leaving soil bare, heavy use of annual plants, replacing perennials and so on. And that's what we've seen occurring. And so we, we you know, developing skills to try and reverse that and address it. Over time, the shallower and more labile soil carbon, which is in the top few centimetres, um, that soil carbon decreases and to a point where our health, the health of our soils is now in jeopardy. Given that 95% of life on land resides in the soil and that it is the top 6 inches or 150 mil that actually feeds the world, having a good understanding of soil and plants might actually be desirable. Um, we showed this morning the link between healthy soils, healthy food, healthy humans. Where does that appear in the conversations today? Perhaps only in these types of venues. But um, it's a huge opportunity to, for all of us to communicate that and put systems and practices and so on into place through, from the policy level down. I mean, as farmers, we know how to do this, um, how to build it. So agriculture has largely used an extractive model, think mining, over the last centuries and... Terry McCoskey the other day was saying, we'll go back 8,000 years, it's probably about when it started. Um, and more recently, it reliant increasingly on synthetic fertilisers and chemicals. And we ask ourselves a question, why? Well, you know, to be blunt, just follow the money trail, and it tells you a lot. So the health of soils can be measured within three soil indicator groups, namely the physical, the chemical, and the biological. And as a famous gentleman called Lord Kelvin said, you can't measure, you can't manage, I like it there, right, you can't manage what you don't measure. And we've seen some terrific examples of actually the, the value of data and effective analysis of data leading to terrific outcomes. So I think that's all upside. Of the various ways to describe and measure a healthy soil, um, the percentage of total organic carbon is considered by many as the apex indicator. And soil ecologist Dr Christine Jones um, has specialised in understanding the function and behaviour of carbon in the soil and its role, as she calls it, the key driver for profit. And you can go and look at her amazing carbon.com website. There's a lot of great information on that. So how do we get carbon back into the soil and what's the role of plants and what skill sets and knowledge do we need to possess? So she describes the liquid carbon pathway as the process whereby photosynthesis draws down CO2 from the air and when combined with water forms simple sugars or carbohydrates, considered by many as the building blocks for life. 
So these plants, the plants convert these sugars into more complex compounds, and some of you may have got right into that sort of thing, but um, some of which are used for plant growth and others for feeding the soil community via the root tips of the plant, those really fine root tips and the feeder roots, those white ones. Um, this substance, often referred to as exudates, exudates, is the nectar that feeds the microbes. And you can see it in the soil, the previous diagram, we saw the soil mineral diagram. And that includes the fungi, the bacteria, the worms, nematodes, protozoas, enzymes, and so on. And you might recall, I think it was, was it Jess on one of you had, you showed the, um, one of the plants you pulled out and you see the exudates and the, all the, the microbial activity in that ribosome around that. And that's, that's really where all the life happens in that exchange between the soil and the plant. Um, so it's the presence and activity of these microbes that drives the process of soil aggregation, soil structure, the rhizosphere, water holding capacity, and the formation of organic carbon and materials such as humus, which is a highly stable and extremely long-lasting form of soil carbon, usually at depth. And that happens mainly through the agency of fungi. However, the conditions of our brittle soils in this country does pose serious limitations. So carbon, soil carbon arising from root exudates is not to be confused with the soil organic matter, which results from decomposition on the surface of the soils from materials such as crops, pasture residues, plants, trees, animal newers, compost, and so on. And unlike annual grasses, perennial grasses, which once dominated the Australian landscape prior to settlement, maintain a continual photosynthetic pathway to feed the plant and soil microbiome. I mean, I'm sure you know all this, but I just wanted to sort of summarise it and come into some soil carbon projects. So their roots, the perennial roots, can penetrate soil at great depth. We've got some terrific photos and examples of that wherever we travel. And they build and feed the topsoil, subsoil, and beyond. So how effectively they do this depends on the physical and chemical properties of a particular soil, access to water, and the influence of management practices, particularly, um, that's probably the, the key element that's often overlooked, is just the role of the landholder and what they do and what happens between the years. So what are we doing at a local level? And I'll just give you a quick summary. This is our Mount, Mount Alexander Region Ag Program. That we've fortunately got some members in the room here. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a number of activities there. And these are tasks and topics we cover, such as climate, region ag, soil health, plant biology, soil testing, multi-species cover cropping, managed grazing, grass identification, re -veg, dung beetle, soil amendments and stimulants, compost and biochar. So there's a lot. And you think, well, what curriculum do I need to undergo as a farmer to build my skills? Really, it's pretty hard to exclude any of those. Um, so this, this program here, or curriculum, really follows the continuous improvement cycle. So we don't try and do it all at once. We just try and build the core skills and on, leverage on top of that. And as we go, we learn further. Just again, like young Jess here was saying, that you look at something, you don't know what it means, but you go back and it starts to make sense and you build on that, make better decisions. So how does the program work? Well, it's an opt-in program. Engagement starts by sharing information in workshop settings, followed by this learning by do, doing model which is in the paddock with trials, demonstrations, field trips, and particularly mentoring from experts. And we found that's particularly valuable. Um, we also have a very active, and this is almost by chance, because people said at the beginning, we don't want social media group, none of that sort of stuff. We'll just stick with emails. Well, what we found after we'd done a particular mentoring round with one of the educators was that we still wanted to keep in touch. And so well, let's try, or someone suggested WhatsApp. So I figured out, learned how to run WhatsApp, and we set this thing up. And it's been fantastic. It really has been awesome. And every day, I mean, isn't it? it was, people are posting things on there. Try this, try that. This is what we've done. This is what we've done. How do you? I mean, it's just very fertile. It's, it's been terrific. Um, so moving on now is, that's just some random pictures of, from our area, our group. But again, they look familiar to most of you, I'm sure. Um, so, from a carbon project point of view in the market, we, we are involved and some of the people in the group are involved um, at engaging with soil carbon projects under the federal government's methodologies. These are some of the methodologies that affect the agricultural sector. There's about another 25 that are beyond that. And the one circled is the one that relates to soil carbon. Very complex documents, but 
you, once you get your head around them, then you've got a guide and you can follow that, and, and that eventually leads to you to be able to monetize the carbon that you build if you choose to. So, and out of that, you get accus and so on. So, and there's some steps here. You can get that off the government's website as to actually how to run a carbon project. But let's look at some, um, some case studies. So this is one up near Caniva. Um, it's a terrific example. It's 300 mil rainfall. It's pretty low. Um, and by, by the application of regenerative agricultural principles that the farmer takes on board that they feel comfortable with running with, um, each of the case studies shows that there are significant levels of soil carbon that have been built. The farming systems have changed and they've generated an additional income stream. And this has only occurred due to a significant and measurable increase in soil carbon. Of course, there are other non-soil carbon benefits. Um, but the great thing about soil carbon is if you decide to sell it into the marketplace, not only is it the additional income stream which is rising all the time, but no one takes the carbon away from you. It stays in your soil, it's yours, you got it, right? I mean, where else can you find that sort of thing in, in business anywhere? You sell something and you keep it and you get paid. It's, so, so here is just some numbers that you can quickly see. I hope you can see this. And just, that in the carbon estimation area one, which is the area that actually the, what you showed, saw on the screen previously, that one there, that's CEA2. We have to give them names. So that was the farmer's worst paddock. Right? And they said, well, there's nothing, no harm done. Let's just figure out what's going on there. So you saw that picture, that, that's his daughter there now. And within a couple of years, he's got these amazing cover crops, multi-species cover crops growing. But come back to the numbers in, say, in the second CEA, which is the bottom one, he's increased his carbon levels by, and you can see the raw numbers there, but it's a 42% increase in the topsoil, 0 to 30. And in the, the um, 30 to a metre, because we go down a metre, he's increased the carbon levels by 128%. I mean, these are remarkable numbers on the worst paddock with a low rainfall. And people say, look, it's a lot, about, it's a lot to do with the rainfall. Of course it is. But this just shows what you can do if you're sort of heading in the right direction. He does not have all the answers by any means, but he's a smart farmer and he's thinking about what he's doing. So, and that's equivalent to about 16,000 tonnes of CO2 per hectare per year. And over the time of this project he's been doing, which is about five years, he's earned an additional $120,000 income were he to choose to monetise it or he can just sit on it. So his worst paddock is close to his best paddock now. Um, the next one is actually at Collins Isis property. A few people have mentioned him. He's one of our mentors, so we thought we'd go back to him and do some work with him because he's been doing this for 20 years, building carbon. This is an MLA trial, and you can see that's a single species um, which is barley cover crop, and that's the multi-species with six multi-species there. So we did the gross margin analysis, looked at how much it cost him to put that crop in versus that, so that was an extra $43 per hectare. Um, and by the way, and of course we analysed all this, and I won't go into the detail how many days and so on, but his, the upshot was his lambs doubled in weight in that time, so you can put that money in your pocket. Um, the soil, and, and this is... Sorry, this is, this is, I should be looking down here, shouldn't I? Um, this, this is even more remarkable because if you look at the, the shift in soil nutrients, you found that, and you can see it on the screen, hopefully it's legible, that on the single species with the barley, his carbon levels went down by 15%, yet on the other it increased by 21%. So that's a 36% swing, extraordinary. Um, but and again, people look at carbon, but what about the other nutrients? So there's a drop in nitrogen on one, there's an increase in nitrogen on the other, um, phosphorus both increased, drop in calcium, increase in calcium, the same thing for magnesium. So how do you put a price on those unless you go and buy those minerals, nutrients, and you know, out of your pocket? So, so let's come and look at his numbers. Okay, so this is pretty much the end. So at the end of it, the gross margin analysis difference is on the single species $854 per hectare versus $2,500 per hectare on the multi-species. So that's a huge magnitude of difference. And if you were to factor in that, take, 
take off that bottom line the loss of carbon and minerals, that's even greater. And I worked out as about nine times. So that's massive, as you can figure out yourself. So just to wrap up, um, what are some of the benefits of building um, building carbon, you know, carbon farming systems? or carbon in farming systems, and you can see some of those listed there. There's also clearly the economic value, the, the mental well-being value, and so on. So it's, it's immense, and we, you know, it leads to vibrant communities, resilient communities, and great economics. So this is possible. These are just two case studies, two examples. Um, not everyone's going to look like this. Others might be better, they might be worse, who knows, but we, we don't have enough of these to really draw a lot of conclusions other than it's, it's certainly working well, and people know how to do it. So my last challenge to you is, you know, what's our vision going forward? And what can you do on your property? So I'll leave it at that. No worries. Thank you very much, Dean. And as I threatened a slightly different final presentation before afternoon tea, on multi-species cover crops in farm systems. So a perfect segue, those two case studies, into our next guest speaker, Jade Kaloran, an independent cover crop advisor and researcher, and also with the Central Victorian Regenerative Farmers Group. Um, Jade has worked for Southern Farming Systems as a research and extension officer at AGF Feeds. Um, and to be honest, I think that she rather likes to get her hands in the soil. So. Uh, Things he really enjoys doing is getting on, out on farm, helping farmers and evaluate the effects of cover crop adoption on farming systems. And now with a bit of magic, I should just go like that and Jade should appear. Hello. Hello. I can hear you. You can hear me. Ready when you are, Shaky. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, so first off, thank you very much to the North Central CMA um, for supporting Regen farmers uh, throughout their region. Uh, thank you to the great speakers we've had already and uh, most importantly, thank you to all of you uh, for coming along to the Soils Forum today. It's really exciting. Mel told me that there's at least 115 registered today, so that's an amazing effort. Uh, I'm really excited to present uh, the CVRF or the Central Victorian Regen Farmers Group, their, um, their experiences uh, and take-homes from the adoption of multi-species cover crops in their grazing systems. So I won't spend too much time on this slide, but the group is quite diverse. Um, it's uh, in the east, it's over towards um, Dalesford with some fairly high carbon soils uh, with the reasonable amount of rainfall, uh, over towards the west near Avoca, uh, quite light soils and um, the rainfall drops down accordingly. So. We have quite a diverse uh, range of farmers, quite small scale operations to going across to quite large operations, but mostly centred around livestock with a little bit of cropping uh, mixed in as well. So uh, the CVRF approached me in 2019 and uh, after they received some funding and they were really excited about some of the potentials that they'd heard about multi-species cover crops. So. Um, and the big one is waking up or activating that soil biology. So uh, all the things that I've listed on the screen in terms of um, soil health and production, in terms of nitrogen fixation, nutrient and moisture cycling and retention, diversity, system resilience, profitability, they really wanted to know how these multi-species cover crops um, could fit into their grazing systems. So uh, we set out to evaluate that. So we did get off to a little bit of a rocky start. Uh, in 2019, there were six farmers that sowed summer multi-species crops. And then in 2020, there were 11 farmers that sowed autumn multi-species crops. And at the start, we wanted to minimise any harm to the soil biology. So we did uh, a, a try and adopt the pasture cropping method that Cole Sice uses in New South Wales. And we tried to direct drill these multi-species mixes straight into active pastures and it was quite unsuccessful uh, as you can see. So we did have some 
pretty ordinary results in that first two sowings until we started becoming a little bit more aggressive with our establishment methods. So although we wanted to um, reduce the use of our chemicals and our cultivation as much as possible, we also had to be practical in achieving uh, a, a good outcome for the multi-species. So this particular picture just shows uh, just a really quick split paddock demo. Uh, the, I'm standing in the control section, which was not chemically terminated, so no roundup before sowing the multi-species. And that really lovely dark uh, green line that you can see in front of me is, is the start of the roundup strip. So there was a huge difference uh, when we started to be a bit more aggressive with our establishment methods. So once we did get our head around the fact that, especially in those first couple of years, those transition years, we had to be a bit more aggressive, we started getting some really good results. And we started pushing feed wedges, hopefully you can all see my mouse, uh, on the left, we started pushing our feed wedges out into that summer period especially, which is so valuable from a dry, uh, a dry land livestock system. So that multi-species mix is just a spring sown mix, um, still rocketing along in December, uh, versus the right-hand side of the paddock, which is a, a, a senest ryegrass clover phalaris pasture. So just a really good example of how to drive those feed wedges. Again, just some more happy snaps all from the group of their various cover crops in very different rainfall uh, and soil type environments, but a lot of success stories here. So just some amazing growth as we've seen uh, earlier today. So as well as supporting the general group with, um, with seed and advice, uh, we also set up to uh, slightly more formal trial sites. So we monitored these trial sites. Uh, and this is the first one at Red Lion, so up towards Maryborough. And um, it's on a silty, uh, sandy type of soil, quite a light soil, um, a bit of compaction underneath as well. And um, and in, in a lighter rainfall zone, so probably that 500 mil rainfall zone. So uh, this was the first time that this particular farmer had tried a multi-species and he was a little bit reserved at the start, which was fair enough because it was a new thing. Um, but this is his summer multi-species. There is a bit of weed in there, uh, but he got two grazings off this over the summer in 2019 um, compared to his paddock, uh, to his hills behind him are quite dry. So certainly a lot of valuable feed and he was quite excited about it. Uh, which was great, and in autumn 2020 uh, he expanded his sowings to include uh, quite a bit more than his formal trial site, so he rolled it out across the farm. In 2020 we did a bit of monitoring uh, and we uh, we sowed, we uh, cultivated and chemically controlled the paddock because there was quite a wire weed burden in, in this particular paddock, and we also took the opportunity to set up a bit of a fertiliser trial as well, so the paddock was sown uh, with the same autumn uh, six-way blend, um, cereals, vetch, two brassicas and chicory. Uh, but then we watered it and we put various fertiliser treatments that you can see down the bottom of the screen. So we had no fert, biological um, foliar spray, uh, MAP spread at 70 kilos per hectare and then the MAP and biologicals. So each quarter of the paddock was assessed uh, and from left to right, you can see three of the four results. So the left-hand side is no fertiliser at all, which is giving us 800 kilos. This is from a May sowing, and I cut this paddock uh, in, on the 31st of August. The biologicals I didn't take a picture of at the time. The MAP is the, um, the hoop in the middle, uh, and that's me cutting the MAP plus biologicals. So um, we gained a huge amount of dry, uh, dry matter by... Um, just amplifying, amplifying the amount of fertiliser that we had there. So although we do want to um, reduce the amount of synthetic ferts, uh, a little bit of starter fert in the form of MAP is not a huge burden to the paddock, um, particularly if it's not top-dressed again, which it wasn't, um, but you can see the amount of biomass that we can produce by having that fertiliser there. But interestingly and um, excitingly, I thought the MAP and biological result with nearly three tonnes of feed on offer there was just fabulous. And you could see it all through the year that it was visually just um, luxurious and green and just lovely. So while we were having some really good um, productivity results above ground, we were also starting to change that soil structure as well. So 
Uh, again, we're looking for those lovely dreadlocked roots um, with biological activity in the rhizosheath, and you can see that happening on this soil, and the soil is becoming much more cake-like um, and, and aggregated there, so having a really good result above and below the ground. Switching across to near Dalesford, this is a, a, an organic regenerative farm, um, paddock to plate farm uh, near Dalesford, and they had recently taken over a paddock, uh, an old hay paddock, uh, and it was in a pretty sorry state. So in the summer of 2019, they uh, hard grazed and direct drilled a summer multi-species mix, but unfortunately the competition was too much. So we had our first taste of the fact that we had to be a bit more aggressive in this paddock. Uh, so in autumn 2020, we offset disc the paddock and then sowed most of the paddock down to a multi-species mix and, again, took the opportunity to do a little bit of fertiliser trial as well. But being an organic farm, it's all uh, biological uh, organic products. So the paddock, uh, the picture on the left-hand side, again, this is the 31st of August from an autumn sowing it's mostly onion grass with a little bit of cape weed. Onion grass doesn't cut very well, so uh, secateurs don't do a very good job of trimming off onion grass, and it has really no nutritional value for livestock at all. So I didn't actually cut anything off this um, particular uh, control strip. Uh, there might be a couple of hundred kilos of cape weed there in patches throughout, but not very nutritious for our livestock. In the middle, uh, what happened here was we left the multi-species just as the seed alone with no amendments and it was growing us 900 kilos at the same time our control pasture was growing us not much at all. The third strip where you can see uh, on the right hand side is just the addition of a worm tea seed coat onto that seed and the use of a foliar worm tea spray as well. So very little amendment per hectare um, at very little cost but giving us 1.6 tonnes to the hectare of feed. So you can see, again, the ability to drive a feed wedge, yes, with the addition of multi-species uh, seed, but also feeding it as well. And again, um, really encouraging results in terms of soil structure and uh, root depth and density. So we're seeing that biological activity, those roots starting to cover up and become dreadlocked, and some really nice soil aggregation starting to happen. So again, really good, really quick, uh, early um, results from both above ground and below ground. So in summary, uh, I think there's a fantastic opportunity. I, I work across Victoria with Lancare Networks and I see a lot of farms, uh, mostly in uh, livestock systems. I think there's a fantastic opportunity to have a win-win. So while we are feeding our above ground livestock, whatever they happen to be, we're also having a really good um, uh, effects on our soil health and our biological activation as well. So I think we can have our cake and eat it too with the multi-species from a short-term uh, economic viewpoint to keep the business viable and profitable, um, but also while enjoying longer-term uh, soil health benefits and environmental benefits. So if that was interesting, um, I do have uh, Facebook and Twitter pages under Healthy Farming Systems where I just put up trial results um, and happy snaps from paddocks like the one that you can see now. Uh, and also I've just listed a few resources across Victoria um, that I think might be helpful as well in terms of cover crops. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much for that presentation, Jade. And um, you'll be on standby and joining our panel after afternoon tea as well, so thank you for that. Um, thank you again to all of our guest speakers this afternoon. We will be um, rearranging the stage during afternoon tea and uh, coming back and it'll be your turn to fire off some questions, get some additional perspectives. Should be terrific. Um, one thing I'd like to do before we cut for afternoon tea is not tell you off for a change. That's good. But rather to say that uh, Penny has to leave. Aeroplanes wait for no soils advocate. So uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, it's been a pleasure not just learning from you but appreciate you staying to learn from us as well. So thank you. Well buses to airports wait for no one either. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Please thank Penny again. And now let's go and see what's for afternoon tea and we'll go through the usual thing. Um, you'll go and have afternoon tea, I'll get snippy and then we'll start. Excellent. Thank you.
Okay. I don't think people can break them up. I'm really sad because I'm no longer the centre of attention. There I was with my big podium and being seen by everyone. Now I'm just down on the floor with the plebs. It's okay. So back to my working class roots. Instead, we've handed the stage over to um, four, and when, when, the flick, when the switch is flicked, the fifth speaker from this afternoon, and I'm going to have to go really hard because I've left my notes behind, Jess and Andrew and Danny and Dean and Jade. Now, throughout the afternoon, a lot of you have been really good, both on Slido, who are networking through the internet, as well as here in the room, at putting questions up. So we have a bunch of questions that are ready to be asked. But of course, I want you to also vocalise those. So we have two roving microphones in the group. Um, Joe has one. And well, we have one roving microphone in the group. Budget cuts here at the CMA. It's a shame the SAWS advocate isn't here for us to harangue them for more microphone money. Um, but it's as simple as that. We've got the four, five guests. And shall I get the first question off Slido while you organise one back there, Joe? So, um, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Let's start with Richard's question. And this is a general one to all of the people in this group about what paddock preparations do you do before sowing? Because I heard from Jade, who talked about the fact we didn't want to, but we actually had to kick some paddocks pretty darn hard to get some good establishment. So, Jade, maybe you'd like to start first about that decision making that you went through to, um, to decide whether it was a, a roundup time or a uh, we'll be patient time. Sure, thank you. So it's very dependent on soil type and the pasture base in the paddock. So if it's a clean paddock and it's been disturbed before in the recent past, it's usually much easier to get that multi-species up and going. But if it's a perennial pasture or a weedy pasture and it happens to be on a medium to a heavy soil type, it can be extraordinarily difficult to get that multi-species up and going. So it is situation dependent. Um, Further south, uh, down towards Warrnambool in the Hatesbury region, uh, we had similar trouble um, using the soil key machine, which is a low-impact sewing machine. And uh, a colleague and I actually uh, invented, I suppose, it sounds very fancy, but we put together a cultivation calculator, which is actually free on the Hatesbury website as a resource. So that might be um, helpful for people to go and have a look at. So it runs you through a scenario that you can input your own individual scenario and then it spits you out a recommendation, a recommended cultivation level. Cool. Thank you, Jade. Dean, can you expand on that too and the decision making that you made when you were doing your multi-story, multi multi-species um, sewing? And there's a microphone you must talk into, otherwise our guests online don't no, hear. I wasn't very good at that before, was I? Um, in our group, it's there's a fair, fair predominance of people who want to farm biologically and not use chemicals. And I think on balance, those who have used chemicals, particularly herbicides, and some sort of fertiliser hit at the beginning have been more successful. Um, a lot of our group are sort of smaller farmers they, with acreage maybe under 300 acres in that, that, that language. And they've set out with the aspiration of putting a cover crop because they've seen all the pictures of how this stuff can be. And even Jess is the first one there. They, they see this fantastic result and get inspired by it, but don't realise necessarily of what the preparation was. They just see the outcome. And so what the conclusion I personally have come to is that if you want to run with biologicals and no synthetics, you've got to sow dry, arguably, because the weeds will kill everything, as we heard. And secondly, you may, depending on, and Jade's comment was, I think I'd agree with that, not that I wouldn't agree, but um, <laughs> is that you've really got to get the soil prepared right. So it may mean that you run across it and do a light cultivation just to wake the system up. Because if you don't, we know there's a, just a, an army of things that just want to take it out. Oh, yeah, persistent weeds. Just just nod your head or otherwise, but that's kind of the feeling that you had too when um, you and Joe were deciding at the beginning of your amazing trials um, what was going through your mind as to do we spray, do we cultivate, or do we just whack it on and hope for the best? Pick up microphone before you answer question, please. Don't need to touch buttons, just talk. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Mum and I went straight in with herbicide and have no regrets. I think that the Regen Ag community has somewhat snookered itself with uh, the demonisation of herbicide. Over the last three years, I've seen the greatest cause of failure is poor weed control. When you have failure, you then lose motivation and enthusiasm and you lose your potential to influence others to convert. Um, the Haggertys, who are a renowned regen farming uh, family in WA, use glyphosate uh, readily and they have recorded low to no glyphosate residue at the end of the season. Grant Sims uses glyphosate. Colin Size doesn't use glyphosate, but he does use herbicide. These are some of the best farmers in the world. The alternative to that is actually low diversity, low soil carbon storage or loss of carbon and low nutrient cycling if you actually aren't able to establish those crops and just keep going how you were. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Andrew, Danny, did you want to add anything there before we move on? Yeah, I'll insert myself. Um, no, just quickly, and um, Jade uh, and Jess, um, you might have something to say about this as well, but um, I agree. Uh, but I think the uh, one thing that gets overlooked really quickly is the best thing that you can do if you are using herbicide is so simple, and that's include fulvic acid in your mix. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... You know, we've we've completely demonised chemical use, um, and and to um, to another extent, um, uh, disturbing soils. But to to start and to get that established, you actually need to do something about that. Um, and by by putting fulvic acid into that mix, you actually give your soil ecology the best chance to regenerate and utilise and break that herbicide down. Uh, in order to to kind of create that ecosystem that you're trying to achieve, so long term outcome and maybe long term, you know, you you'll be off the herbicide. But yep. to begin Jade. with, that's probably the the best tip. I love seeing anybody. Jade is nodding amazingly on Zoom there as well. So Can I just say, sorry, Jonathan. Um, we use we've started using molasses as our wetter in with the herbicide. So two liters of molasses instead of a um, synthetic wetter. And that acts as a buffer, so that's a really um, easy way to start buffering herbicide. Okay. Normally, you pay $150 an hour for this kind of advice, so you're getting great value this afternoon. So, um, Joe, you've got a question from the floor. Okay. Uh, well, Jess, I was just asked, I was intrigued by the fact you use make sure you have put plenty of phosphorus when you start your pastures, and I think the fact that. Uh, legumes need phosphorus if they're going to fix nitrogen. So I think that sounded good. But the question I have is, if you are going to have phosphorus, what is the difference between the phosphorus which comes from the you know, synthetic fertiliser and the phosphorus which might come, say, from a more organic fertiliser? Or, or, or Who wants to take that one? Please, Jess, yes, yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the question. The... Uh, the difference between synthetic and biological almost always is speed. Synthetic, um, as we saw in Danny's talk, can get the crop away really quickly. It bounces out of the ground. Um, and biologicals are a slow burn. And you can lose faith halfway through and wonder what you've done. Um, but the science does show that, that long term, the biological fertiliser stays around whereas, um, you know, superphosphate might give a, a pulse at the beginning and then fade away quite quickly. Um, but another massive factor is that superphosphate locks up other nutrients, magnesium, calcium, boron, I think, don't quote me on that, whereas biologicals don't lock up other nutrients, so that's a key difference. I love it when someone's answering and other panellists are nodding. That is just awesome. Jay, did you want to add anything to that? I think Jess has covered that really well, so I'm just going to leave that there. No worries. It's just you were nodding quite vigorously. Um, okay, let's go back to Slido. 
They're all questions for Jessica, and you've been talking so much. Um, actually, Danny, this one's for you, and this is from a really important person called Jonathan. And this is the idea that we've all been talking about data and data points, and you showed that picture of the drone, which I think was delivering herbicides, but IoT, Internet of Things, and the fact that data is becoming more and more readily available at satellite down to fence post level. What opportunities does this data have for farmers, whether they're um, going multi-species cropping or something else? Pick up microphone and speak. <laughs> um, oh, look, it's got enormous potential. And um, I was having a conversation just out at morning tea that about um, the, yeah, being able to, I suppose, advocate for greater access to that sort of data and education programs and extension programs to use that data. So what we're seeing, and any agros in the room? I'm sure any agros online, put your hand up. Um, uh, no. Um, we're seeing more and more, you know, we were talking about this, um, this idea of, like, governments and policy makers um, and people with frameworks we readily across industry hear about, you know, um, increasing productivity. Um, but the biggest problem at the moment, and, and even with the Internet of Things, is that increase in productivity kind of stops with the consultant. Uh, and the end user is the one that ends up paying more because, they, because there's such a, um, you know, it's so opaque, that, that barrier, that um, the end user ends up needing to pay people to interpret that data or to, to utilise that data for their own decision making. So I think it's got incredible potential, but our challenge is actually making that readily available to land managers and to farmers and enterprises, and then being able to translate that across or create ex education programs so that they can utilise uh, what that is in order to make the decisions that they need to make. Cool. Thank you, Danny. Andrew, I'm going to pick on you with a question from Sally, and that is because you put up a slide that showed uh, school students actually actively involved in your program. Yep. How did you actually do that engagement for your ReVeg program? Um, that's pretty much just a function of land care in, in the community. So we work with uh, a lot of the schools, provide them with uh, talks on biodiversity and soil and all that sort of thing. Uh, provide them a little bit of funding to get projects done and in return they like to take the day off to come out and be what some of them say slave labour but others others really enjoy it. So the um, the secondary college which was uh, was in that photo, they, they come out every year um, and we just pick a spot. They actually, with some of their teachers, camp out overnight and make a, a, a sort of camp out of it. Cool. That sounds like a lot of fun and yeah, it is slave labour but Hey, that's been going for thousands of years, right? Um, Andrew, it's interesting because, again, some of the good conversations happen at coffee, don't they? But we're speaking to a teacher about that idea that whether it's an agricultural or a land care program, you kind of need, or a gardening program, you need that principal, you need that school counsellor, you need that teacher who in some ways has to step up to make it happen. It's, it's not like down from Spring Street says... Land care or regen ag is important or ag science is important, do it. There's many a slip twixt that big statement up here and boots on the ground delivering it down here, isn't there? Um, there is. Uh, fortunately, most of the schools will have had that person step up. Um, other times when I've tried to um, approach the school, it's, it's very much been a case of there's too much already happening in their curriculum. They don't want to burden their teachers with, with additional workload. And even when you say, um, I'll do all the work for you, they still seem to think there's a catch. But, but generally speaking, uh, we've had success with teachers that have actually stood up and said, we want to do something a bit different. Have any of you involved with schools ever done what SOARS advocates and others have said, which is, who is your boss? <laughs> and what is their email address? <laughs> no, sorry, terrible. Um, okay, let's go on. Oh, this is very agronomical. This is from Calvin. I can't actually understand it. My soil calcium magnesium ratio is around one to one. Should I correct this ratio to more like five to one before trying to sow multi species crops? Jade. Jade. <laughs> did, did that question Hello. make sense to you? 
Yeah, so you'd like the calcium to be much higher, so um, around about 60% as a percentage basis, and the mag to be something like 10 or 15%. So um, in a one-to-run ratio, the mag is quite high, and it will result in a really sticky, especially if it's a clay base, which they usually are if they're high magnesium soils, there'll be a very sticky um, soil to work with when they get wet. And if you walk across the paddock in boots, you'll end up several inches higher. And it's very difficult for plants to get going in, in that situation when it's that high. So I would recommend probably a little bit of gypsum, especially if you're going to be cultivating um, to get the gypsum before you sow the multi-species and work it in uh, shallowly if you can, um, depending on the level of cultivation, just to start that multi-species off with with a bit of uh, an improved soil. So I do have heavy clay soils down here with high magnesium ratios and we do get multi-species going in them, but it, the pH and, and the calcium to magnesium ratio is fairly important to start addressing the, the, some of the main constraints. So if, if you can, Kelvin, uh, you don't have to have a perfect, but a little bit of improvement would be great. Perfect. Joe, have you found any worthy, oh, worthy volunteers from the floor for a question? No. Don't forget, all you have to do is put your hand up. Oh, no, wait. Sorry to all those um, Slido people, but, you know, we're trying to do about a 50-50 because -50, about 50% online, 50% in the auditorium kind of a feel. Um, I'm not a farmer, but I'm just wondering for my home garden, and I've heard about dolomite being not good because it locks out the calcium, something like that. Is it better to just use lime, not dolomite lime? Is there an agronomist in the house? Jade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so dolomite... Dolomite lime has magnesium in it, so it would depend on the – it's back to magnesium again. It would just depend on the magnesium content of the soil. So some soils do need magnesium, but on a heavier, more clay-based soil, usually there's enough magnesium to go around, so that would be when you would use straight lime rather than dolomite lime. Thank you. All right. Um, Richard has asked a really good question, and Dean, I might throw to you initially on this, but it might go around the panel. We've always talked about the different species in a multi-species mix. Um, have you got any examples of native grasses being put in those mixes? Microphone. Oh, sorry, Dave. That's all right. Um, I can't think of anyone at the moment that where that's happening, because native grasses tend to be... Um, if you were to sow them because you don't have them, they're very expensive. It's very expensive to harvest. Um, I know within our group there's a few, including ourselves, who are looking at putting um, um, both native, sparse, um, na native species of grasses and perennials um, into the autumn mix, hoping that you know, when it comes post-spring they will then find their roots and off they go. But I think the major barrier, and even though in our in our group we have a field ecologist who comes and gives us guidance and ident helps us identify what all the grasses are, because most of the time you probably don't know what 80% of. If, it, if you know 80%, you're doing well, I reckon. Um, <clears throat> but the, the major challenge is understanding what native grasses you've got accessible at an affordable price and what contribution they will make. That's probably all I can say. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose on one level it sounds really worthy and almost intuitive that native is good, good, but well, you also have to worry about are there dollars in it? Yeah, I think I'd actually turn the question back the other way and ask people, well, do they know what native grasses they have on their property and what can they do about actually creating an environment that those native grasses want to prosper? And we've, we've started to see that on our own property because of the way we manage and rest, manage the stock and rest the paddocks. So if you graze it at the right time and allow enough recovery time, those natives will start to appear. And we're seeing that already now with amazing um, um, uptakes of kangaroo grass, for example, which is sort of exciting because it stands out and it's, it's a great native perennial. It is. No worries. Did anyone else want to add to that? Danny? Um, the most uh, kind of famous example, I, th I think, is probably Colin Size and the work he's doing at Winona. So um, that's been built up, built up over time, but he, I'm quite sure he's putting multi-species. Uh, he's certainly pasture cropping. That's what, he, that's what he's renowned for. But 
um, he's been working on that native on those native pastures on the farm for quite some time now, and um, seeding over the top. So uh, that's more or less the whole concept of that pasture cropping movement. Um, so if you look at the Winona website, there's some really good resources. Cool. Yeah. I'll just say that we've um, we've got a couple of Colin gifted us a couple of bags of native species from his property. Um, not all of them will grow down here, but there's a bunch of them like red grass and others and so on that he's he's able to harvest because he's got them at sufficient quantity. Now he's got over 150, 150 to 180 or thereabouts different um, species of grasses and forbs on his property, which is quite extraordinary. So, yeah, I think Colin's probably the right guy to ask, assuming that his knowledge from there is transferable to here, which it probably is to a large degree. Yeah. It does get back to the bigger question too about um, where, how many generations till things like native plants are part of our farming systems. That you know, it's, we, We're sort of coming to a tipping point somewhere in the not-too-distant future perhaps. Um, Sally, I'm going to leave your question about uh, what have you done today to make yourself proud perhaps as the last question for the day, just to finish off. But instead, Jessica, did you grow many legumes in your mix? Do you think you could alter the mix to obtain a higher... And you can explain what me is because that's me, M-E is... <laughs> Metabolizable energy. Um, the first, the answer to the first question, legumes in the mix, yes, there was maybe five different species, clover, beans, lentils, vetch. Um, as I said in the talk, the preferential grazing of the stock meant that they were leaving the legumes to last um, without exception until the spring. So we had to weigh up whether you're leaving the stock in there and forcing them to eat the legumes that are left and how that affects the weight gain of the stock. So for the last couple of years, we've been taking stock out of multi-species pastures where the cereals and brassicas are an inch high and beans and vetch might be a foot high. And we've just made the decision that if they don't want to eat it, hopefully they know better than us. And we were just talking in uh, the smoke room before that it's amazing those beans will hang around and then one day you come down and they're just gone. Like they just wipe them for some reason. Something changes. But as I say, hopefully they know best and when they do want to eat them, they eventually do. In terms of um, altering the energy by altering the mix, the mix wasn't the problem. In, you know, in one case I mentioned there were 36 different species. It was a smorgasbord. The problem was the height and that we hadn't kept on top of um, the vegetative state. Sorry, agri agronomical question again. What is it about a low pasture that has a better ME to a more established one? It remains in a vegetative state, so it's continuing to grow. Um, I've heard a couple of times that plants are intrinsically lazy, so if, oh, they're, not, <laughs> yeah, if they're not forced to work, they won't. Um, I heard another um, quote that plants going to seed are like um, when your friends have kids and they stop hanging out and coming to the pub. And so when they're in the vegetative state, they keep communicating with the microbes in the soil and cycling nutrients and trading and sharing. Uh, when they start to go vegetative, they just focus on themselves and focus on filling the seed head. So everything starts to shut down. So again, because there's a garden in the room, I'll use a gardening analogy. It is a bit like some of the green leaves like spinach and silver beet. You keep picking the leaves so it keeps growing leaves because you're encouraging it not to go to seed but to continue. Exactly. And it tastes better when you eat the younger, fresher leaves. Exactly. So... I have things in common with sheep. How lovely. Um, okay. Uh, we did that legumes. Um, Jade, for your fertiliser trial, did you do a costing of the fertiliser as a sort of tonnes per hectare, dollars per tonne per hectare kind of a um, comparison? I'm not sure I get that. Mm. Tonnes per hectare is not a pricing, is it? I guess it is if you know how many, what the tonnes are. Uh, so on, on those um, smaller trials, we didn't do a costing, but we do have a project with the CVRF that's just wrapped up that was a split paddock trial, conventional versus regen, and we did costings there, and it was obviously conventional fertiliser on the conventional side and biological ferts on the regen side. And 
uh, in most instances, the um, biologicals were cheaper, uh, a little bit more labour intensive to put out, but they ended up being quite cost effective per hectare in comparison to synthetics. And we actually were uh, more profitable most of the time on the regen side than the conventional. So some good early results. Interesting. Any other people had those experiences of pricing out fertilisers yeah. in these trials? In, yeah, in the, um, the example that I showed from Collins Isis property, we had the table, which probably wasn't very legible from back there, but that's where we did the gross margin analysis. So all the costs, everything was completely head-to-head -head comparable. Um, and you saw the, the first image that showed between the, the, the single species barley and the multi-species, it was, let's say, um, about $43 difference per hectare to establish. Um, and from then on, the major difference was just the re result of the productivity gains by virtue of the multi-species crop performance, then overlaid with the carbon value, carbon benefit at the end as well. And often, I think we some of us have talked about this before, but you know, you can do soil tests and so on, but ultimately what like Jess showed the BRICS levels for the different um, different stages, you know, the pastures there and the multi-species. And <coughs> this, the same thing applies when you look at the gross margin analysis and work it all through, why would you put something in there that it's actually going to be... And I, I think it's just a lack of people getting exposed to that data, but if you knew you had two options and one was going to give you a massive gross margin value and the other is going to give you very little by comparison, that's almost counterintuitive because unless people have done the numbers themselves, they won't know. Yeah. And then you overlay it by the carbon value or the loss in carbon, then the other mineral nutrients, additional nutrients you've got available put a price on those versus the loss on those. It's a powerful story, but who, who would do that normally? I think you need an app. Yeah, that's right. Someone get, Jade's got an app, maybe do another one. For sure. Um, we do have an auditorium question. Um, on that note, if we start talking about uh, dollars per hectare and um, the savings from doing the regen side, I think we also need to put a cost on our labour because obviously the regen side is a lot more labour intensive. And so I think it's a bit hard to, to compare the two without including the cost of the labour. So in the case that I gave, labour was included and the cost of farming machinery and hours for machinery use was included. But I agree with you. Yeah. So I would say in the long run, regen is less labour intensive than conventional. Do you agree? Do you want to expand on that for me, Jess? Why? I was hoping you wouldn't ask that because I hadn't <laughs> thought it through. Do you want someone else to answer it while you collect your thoughts? Yes, definitely. Anybody else want to talk to that? Danny, Danny you shouldn't have nodded so vigorously. <laughs> I've put myself in that, haven't I? Um, no, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's uh, there's a bit of a curve on that. Um, uh, I think it's perceived to be highly um, intense, uh, you know, a little labour intensive to, to begin with. And the reason for that... Um, I've got no research to back this up, by the way, but I, but I am a bit of a systems thinker, and so I think in that in that sort of model. Um, early on, when you're establishing that method, you're transitioning, so you, you actually don't. You're still learning it, um, and you learn you're figuring out what what it is about your or you know about your property uh, that you need to start to start to kind of work on or focus on, and so you're developing that system. But you get to a point where you've got that system and you've got the model. And then, um, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody, um, one of the delegates today, and as soon as you get that model, um, it actually makes everything much easier because you can put it in, it's not necessarily a calendar, you know, like a yearly calendar, but you can kind of put it into your landscape calendar or uh, we were talking about a, your grazing, um, grazing chart. And then all of a sudden your entire, you know, year or, or that period is, is kind of mapped out for you. So you're making less decisions, you're dealing with less commodities, you're, you know, you're dealing with less kind of bringing, bringing inputs in and, you, and your outputs and all that sort of stuff. So it actually simplifies everything uh, and you just work to that system and that systems model. And I think that's why it gets easier uh, as the time goes on. Mm. A couple of years ago, Colin Sice was in the region and he did a forum, I can't remember if it was an hour or three, but um, on the CMA website there is a video of that with all of his slides and um, towards the end he sort of had all of these kinds of, um, rather than an app, had these 
charts or matrices or whatever and it seemed like you just put in x y and z and a b and c pop out here kind of a stuff and it's also about the timings so yeah i i guess that it's like anything you try something the first time is hard hopefully by year three or four or five jess it becomes a little bit easier yeah the example i came up with during that interlude thank you denny <laughs> um is take take stubbles for example um maintaining or removing stubbles before sowing a crop. I've been watching the neighbours these past couple of weeks getting ready to burn their stubbles. It takes fire breaks, harrowing, speed tillers, burning, um, maybe baling straw, um, as opposed to leaving your stubble residue intact and going in with a disc drill is one pass and you have the, the pastures in, the crops in. Similarly, throughout the year, if you have uh, a multi-species approach or a regenerative approach, then the plants are doing the work for you and putting those nutrients into the ground rather than you coming in, uh, putting on urea, putting on fertiliser and you're doing the work for the plant rather than the plant doing the work for you. Cool. Thank you, Jess. Wait. Just a but wait. Wait. There's, there's more. Just during Jess, Jess's answer, right? Yeah, I had a bit, of, a little bit of a time to think, but no, it's a, it's a really good example. So um, one of the um, plant reflectance slides that I had up during that um, during that talk, uh, that's a really good example of uh, working smarter, not harder, and less labour intensive. So one of those one of those maps, um, particularly on that trial site that we were looking at, um, we've been able to map that. Uh, for plant reflectance down to like, you know, two centimetres per pixel, right? Now, there's Bathurst burr in, in that target area, uh, which would take the, you know, the owner or two of them probably two days to go and, and identify and then chip it all out. I spent two hours on that map and I was able to get the, get the plant reflectance of that Bathurst burr and then let that farmer know where that Bathurst burr is. So all of a sudden, that's half a day of chipping out and half a day of sitting there and just going and just putting dots on a map. So in that capacity, as we start to move through those systems, that's where those efficiencies and the smarter, not harder starts to work. If anyone ever studied ag science at uni, they know that that work experience is chipping out stuff like Bathurst burr. And I'd know they'd all rather be sitting at a kitchen table on a laptop, that's for sure. Um, we have a question, Vanessa. Yeah, I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to stick to one. So our land care group, the Hills Creek Catchment Collaborative, actually has a soil carbon project going, and we have trialed the soil key machine. So I wanted to ask the participants here in the panel if you have, if you used it, because I, I, I'm not sure I understood right, and uh, if there's any difference from the system you did use to sow the cover crops, the multi-species. In our case, it wasn't extremely successful. We didn't use glyphosate and um, I don't know what else might have influenced, but this year we'll try again. So let's see what happens. Spray it hard. Um, you, you talked about carbon there a, a bit, Colin, do, uh, Colin, Dean, would you be able to, uh, you know, when, when, when the master becomes a student? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So it's an interesting one. I get asked that question all the time about the soil key machine. And I think that the intention, the design of it is is smart. And But they're like most agricultural machinery, there are applications where it's really good and applications where it's not. And I think Jade mentioned down at Hatesbury, they used a soil key down there. <clears throat> um, and it wasn't so effective. But it's, that, it's not the case of drawing conclusions saying it doesn't work because if you put in the right application, it, it's terrific. Um, what I should add is, um, and they've marketed this as soil carbon reduction technology, which is interesting. Um, we inherited a machine through our biodynamic community, which was the forerunner of the soil key. And you could say that because theirs is patent pending, I wonder if they actually know that 40 years ago, a biodynamic farmer up had bought with his home engineering skills, just like Don has at home, um, but got a, got, a, got a conache seed box, got a rotary hoe down the bottom, then he got the, the PTO from the tractor and he found, he put an old Holden differential to link the tractor power to run the rotary hoe. Um, and he said that was, and, and the biodynamic farmer who 
previously to me used it and he said this is the best machine he's up near Mansfield best machine I have ever used except he said if you've got rocks in your place, do not use it. You'll, you'll break the differential. <laughs> so they upgraded the diff to, um, I think it's a Nissan four-wheel drive diff, and it's fine. So the value of it, to answer your question, though, is in it, particularly in the existing pasture that you don't want to destroy, and particularly where you've got perennials and you want to keep those, it creates a fertilised seed bed about so wide, and then there's a space, similar space where you, those plants still thrive, so you've got enough time and enough soil tilth to effectively plant those seeds with a decent seed box. And then you can do well and you don't need chemicals or whatever. So it sort of fits that niche of the market, I think. Back to the workshop. You'll be right. Get a welder. You'll be fine. Um, Sarah, did you have a question? Was it you who they're pointing peaches at? I was just going to say... Uh-uh, microphone. No one can hear you. <laughs> just going back to the... Um, tilling um, discussion. Um, I've seen that on a smaller scale with home gardeners using the um, the, the framework of the, um, rather than pulling at, you know, how hard it is to get a uh, um, corn, corn out, of, out of a veggie patch, um, rather than digging that out, why not use that as a framework for um, planting your cabbage or your brassicas, it's going to protect the plant and break down and add carbon and fertilise your plant and do all of those wonderful things. And it's, again, you're working um, smarter, not harder. That's a small scale. Well, you've all been talking about, and Jess, you were talking about that, trash days. It doesn't leave your surface anymore, which is an interesting thing. Still see lots of plumes of smoke across the region come sowing time, but things change and some, I think it's also horses for courses, some soils you need to remove organic material to work it or something, don't you? So anyway, I'm going to ask one more question because time's getting away and it is one for everybody. And um, Andrew, you've been the quietest for a little while, so grab a microphone and answer this. What is the biggest outcome that you are proud of coming from your group or farm since you started your work? Uh, that's a good question. We've only been going for a little while, but uh, I suppose the thing that I've already seen is the um, increased confidence in farmers, the sense of community, the ability to ask what you think might be the dumb question, um, rather than to your next door neighbour who might think you're doing crazy things. We've, we've certainly had... A few farmers who have said that they didn't want to try things in case their neighbour thought they were losing the plot. Um, so I suppose we've created an environment where that's accepted, things, things are trialled and people can talk. Just because Dad did it doesn't mean that I have to do it. That's it. Yeah, cool. Uh, Jade, how about you, um, you know, to paraphrase the song, what have you done recently to make yourself proud? Uh, oh, well, um, I, I was probably going to say that I'm proud of all the farmers that I work with, so... Uh, I'm, I've been interested in the region ag space for about 10 years, but I'm, I'm very proud of all the farmers that have taken the risk and, um, and put a trial in or put a demo in uh, and been open-minded and, and, and adopted region on farms. So very proud of farmers. Okay. Good answer. Good answer. It's not a competition, by the way. Danny. Thanks, Dean. Um, yeah, I'm probably the same. Seeing seeing people take that next step in confidence uh, and the penny drop moments where you might be in a workshop and, you know, someone's come along to a few of them and then all of a sudden you, you just see a look on someone's face and you go, oh, yeah, you've got it. Um, so those things are, are really exciting. And, um, and the risk takers. So, um, you know, people that when you're talking about a trial, you know, you might get a line or someone will say to you, I want to put it in that paddock because I want people to see it. And that's where, you know, you go, oh, yeah, great, okay. That's where, um, you know, that's where they're actually becoming community leaders and and wanting to, you know, showcase their way of thinking or that they're thinking a bit differently. Yeah, so no longer the paddock behind the hill neighbouring the bushland. Okay, that's good. Um, Jess? What is something that you'd say your involvement 
your private, pr proudest outcome or proudest moment in the three years that you've got here? You're not allowed to say getting the Nuffield Scholarship. Um, I guess I would say I'm proud of both my mum and I for everything we've achieved. Um, we've worked really hard. There are only two of us and, you know, that slide I showed of the things that went wrong is the tip of the iceberg, I can assure you. Um, but we got through it and as I also touched on in my talk, having Colin Sice at our place at the end of last year, at the end of the three-year journey, I suppose, and him giving a workshop in the middle of our cover crop, um, I suppose was a dream come true. It's no exaggeration to say. Fantastic. And I think that leaves you, Dean. It, with your involvement through the projects over the last three or four years, what's, what's the proudest achievement? I think that we set out at the beginning to, um, to achieve something, to bring people together, to provide a structure that would foster... Um, a different way of thinking, a, um, shared learnings and a willingness to try. And, you know, the fact that Jess is sitting up here um, sharing her story is, you know, I'm really proud of that. Um, I don't take much credit for it, probably no credit, but because it's, she should take all the credit. But just to create an environment that brings people together so they can share those experiences and learn from each other is awesome. And the WhatsApp group is, a, I think, a perfect example of that. So someone's success becomes someone else's joy, you know. Um, one thing we really haven't touched on in a formal way, but, and all of your answers touched on this in some way, is the community building role of Regen Ag and these farmer groups. Um, I think one or two you've mentioned things like people in the group felt more connected, they were more able to say they belonged, all those sorts of things. So that, I guess it's not in the outcome is a stronger farming community in your patch, but is that an outcome that has... Um, been something that you as facilitators have seen? And Dean, you can go first for a change. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, absolutely. And the fact that, you know, without the group, that, and, and the same I'm sure applies to the others, and Danny was talking about it, that what farmers tend to be pretty individuals, like not pretty, but strong individuals um, in lots of ways, which we could spend talking for hours about. Um, but at the same time, they're isolated too maybe by circumstance, maybe a bit by choice. And so when you, when you do have problems, who do you turn to, to to share that with and who do you lean on? Um, and at the same time, when you do something well and you deserve a pat on the back, it's, it's a pretty unexciting moment when you're the only one looking at yourself in a mirror and go, wow, I did that well. But yeah, More champagne to go around that. You, you want to have a beer with someone in the pub or whatever, you know, just share that, the upsides as well. Yeah. Let's just go across the line. Danny, yourself, do you sense community being built in the work you're doing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're early days, but yeah. Um, and uh, it's kind of this premise of, uh, like, or the, I suppose the reason for it, I'm, I'm going to draw on a... I'm not a farmer, but I am a beekeeper. This kind of there's a saying in beekeeping that it's not the it's not the one person with a hundred hives, but it's the hundred people with one hive that makes all the difference. And I think that's where the social capital stuff comes in. You know, you can have one person in your region doing it, but they're really big regions, and not many people are going to take much notice. But if you've got a hundred people who want to use their front paddock to start a transition and start a movement, that's actually where it where where it really establishes something. Um, and that's, I think that's the, the place that social capital really, um, really has a place, yeah. And Jade, over the groups that you've worked with over quite a long time now, I won't say how many years because you already have, um, what are you seeing in that, I guess, icing on the cake idea of, um, you know, building community as well as building sustainability? Oh, I think it's it's been a game changer for a lot of farmers involved in region is, is the ability to get together and support each other. Uh, and a lot of it has been through social media. So the CVRF are a really good example of that. They they kept going um, via Zoom through uh, COVID and um, and we had a really good turnout on Zoom uh, using social media and the the um, the group's become, been really um, dynamic and, and really communicative. And, and that's across, in the southwest, there's a, uh, a couple of new Facebook groups that have popped up there's more through the North Central CMA catchment. There's three or four. Um, Andrew started one. So there's a lot of uh, involvement that comes with the Regen Ag that's not necessarily seen so much in conventional ag, probably because we're still writing the rule book 
for Regen Ag and, and people need to support each other and chat about what to do and when to do it. So I think it does really help community uh, Regen Ag. True. And Andrew, I would imagine that if I was a farmer with a six metre deep gully going through one of my favourite paddocks and uh, I'd be a bit ashamed and not really wanting to talk too much about it, are you finding that as you find people who want to solve a common problem that people are a bit more open and supportive? Uh, very much so. Um, I think the one thing that we, we tend to underestimate is the, the impact on mental health of, of something like those erosion gullies. Um, I've spoken to a few farmers who are in that situation who initially didn't want to share with, with anyone what was happening on their block purely for that reason. And I suppose uh, in the regen ag space, it's everyone's learning together. You've got that uh, connectiveness um, within the community. So it's, it's certainly a good outlet for those people to just talk about the, uh, the problems that they're facing. Excellent. And Jess, you're not allowed to say Nuffield Scholarship for this. So instead, you know, I guess now as a participant in one of these groups, what do you think? Is that community something that's been important to you and Joe? Um, the area that we're in is extremely traditionist. We actually travel over an hour to um, attend Dean's group in Castle Main. Um, but in saying that, coming here today, we met one of our neighbours, Harry, I think he's gone, um, and we didn't know he was regen and he didn't know we were regen, so it just goes to show. <laughs> So I would say in our particular area, there's not much of a community, but we're sort now that we're in the know, you start to suss each other out or you drive past a paddock and you see that there's multi-species growing in there and then you start finding out whose paddock is that and we didn't know they were doing that and then you, you know, call them up and see what they're up to. Who knows what comes next. Um, I haven't got my phone on me, but I think we're pretty close to the quarter past four. Time to wrap up. So unless there's a burning question from the floor, speak now or forever hold your peace. I wanted to say that once, and I have, so that's good. Um, Joe and Tammy um, have got some little tokens of appreciation for the work that you've done. Um, I'm afraid, Jade, you're going to have to take yours virtually, okay? Um, that's no problem. Yeah, we haven't managed to digitise olive oil yet. <laughs> But um, can you all please join me in thanking the presenters from this afternoon? Um, I'm going to be really naughty and say that I really enjoyed listening to Penny and to Peter this morning with the big picture stuff, but really I think personal experience and storytelling is the way to absorb some of this stuff. And, you know, um, I don't want to be awful, but, gee, if some of you guys can do it, maybe I can too. You never know. So, anyway, thank you so much again to our this afternoon's panel. And I think before I finish up, I need to say... You've been a lovely audience. Thank you so much for all of the great work you've done today, except coming back from breaks. Um, the other thing is to let you know that while we've had a reasonably good auditorium that's turned over a bit through the day, 71 people joined us online through the day as well. So um, people are interested who aren't able to travel to Bendigo for today. And I hope the only thing you missed out on by being in the office or at home is the afternoon tea, which is pretty good. Um, in the meantime, Mandy Colson, who is kind of like the overseer of a lot of these projects with the North Central Catchment Management Authority, my last job is to give you the microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you for all the speakers today. Um, what a depth and spread of knowledge we've had and heard in relation to soils. Just a few closing comments. Uh, there is a fundamental ongoing need for awareness raising in relation to soil health. There is a need for more data, need for more information and tools to restore soil health and achieve soil sustainability. Farmers are on the front line. They are good soil stewards. And we heard today that approximately 70% of farmers are concerned about soil health and looking for ways to improve it. This presents a massive opportunity to create positive outcomes for soils and environmental sustainability. As a soils cohort, we need to understand the importance of knowledge. We need to be able to make the best decisions with the information we have now and continue to grow the knowledge base and make incremental change. The future needs to be collaborative. We need to work together and on behalf of the North Central CMA highly committed sustainable agriculture team, 
which strives to work strongly with agencies, community, traditional owners and industry. We would like to thank everyone for coming today and walking together on this soil journey with us. Thank you for your attendance and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Mandy. Actually, there's one other thing I have to mention before I go. It's called Evaluation Sheet. So lock the doors. <laughs> Everyone start feeling, no, I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. But if you are able to um, do that, I'm going to be really awful and say there's probably an email address at the CMA that you've used to register here. If you need to get going before you finish it, please scan an email. That would be lovely as well. But, yeah, you didn't give yourselves a round of applause. A really participatory group. Thank you so much for all of your input and thank you for the great conversations outside the auditorium as well as inside. Good afternoon. And it's Friday, isn't it? So have a good weekend. <laughs>